Hidden Pro Podcast fans, friends, followers, and family who you happen to be along. This is week 14 of the Niners season. Welcome to the show. We are super excited this week as the Niners travel again out to Cincinnati, Ohio to play the Cincinnati Bengals. Should be a great game, so enjoy that. George is on with starting right guard Dan Brunskill, who talks a little bit about his journey from not very far from California to San Diego State and then to Atlanta, and then finally with the Niners. So the interesting story, great conversation about recovery and training and football and life. So get on to that. And then we just finished with this segment, and so we hope you enjoy that with our MVP vet of the week, Adam Clark. He's from Cincinnati, so he will be wearing Bengal stuff, but he will also be uh, hitting the Bengals, and so we'll get to see them. But he talks about his journey, his Army, Green Beret, and uh, had a six-year trip there and shares with us some of that. And interestingly, you guys know how we are with mindful awareness and performance and meditation and mindfulness. Adam happens to be a yogi and a meditator and talks a lot about how that helped him with his transition. So super excited about that as well. And again, shout out to the six vets from the Ohio National Guard who are also attending the game. And we've got a little bit more information of that in the show as well. So hope you enjoy the show. Stay tuned and go Niners. All right, boys. All right, three, two, one. Two, one. Action! Action. All right. Welcome to it, Dan. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. <sighs> Here we go. All right, Hidden Pearls podcast fans, welcome to week 13. The 49ers are at the Bengals. So just like that, we are back in the thick of it. We knew a we knew that these last few weeks of the season would be a battle, but the loss in Seattle snaps a three-game win streak and drops us back to 500, so at 6-6, six and six, still in the playoff conversation, um, and in control of our own destiny, but obviously still some work to do. This week on the road again, uh, we're traveling to the beautiful city of Cincinnati. It is cold up there, boys, so good luck up there, to play the 7-5 and five Bengals, who come in this week having snapped a two-game win streak of their own with a loss to the LA Chargers, 22-41. to 41. More on them later in the show, but a key component of the team, the 49ers this year, is the starting right guard, Dan Brunskill. So Dan and is another important hog in the offensive line, battling to protect Jimmy and keep that Niner run game rolling. So welcome, Dan, to the Hidden Pearls podcast. Thank you guys for having me. Woo! Welcome, Dan. We're on an right, O-line Dan. streak. The show's been really good because we keep having O-linemen on. <laughs> yeah, we had, uh, we had, we had we Alex go. Mack followed by Lake and Tomlinson. And now we have yeah. Dan Brunsky. Nice. I love it. And then we're, we're going to keep saying nice things too. <laughs> this is your bio. Um, let's see. Dan, you're in your fifth season, just like me, which is pretty awesome. Um, you played college ball at San Diego State. Go Aztecs. Got to love that. Eight. And you were uh, originally entered the league as an undrafted free agent with the Atlanta Falcons in 2017. And then before you got with the Niners, you were in the AAF, right? Yes. And that yeah. is a whole different ball game. You, I can't wait for you to tell us a little bit about that because I've always been curious. <laughs> What's the um, AAF, George? The AAF was the spring league in 2019. Uh, they did it for like – it wasn't like a one-year thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, they ended up canceling the league after, like, eight weeks. It was supposed to go ten weeks and then, like, a little playoffs or, like, championship game. And then, like, eight weeks in, they decided they don't want to do it anymore. So they just kind of fired everybody. And what, what yeah. the, what's the acronym for? What is AAF? Uh, Alliance um, like American Football League, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All what right. was your guys' record in that, by the way? Huh? Who had, Did you have the best record or were – Oh, we'll get to we'll get to uh, I don't know if we had the yet. best record. We were, I think we were just like slightly above like 500 or somewhere in there. Um, we'll get, uh, we'll get to that. Still working. Bit, though. Yeah. Let's see. Um, and then you came to the Niners 2019. And I think we had a pretty good, de- decent 2019 that you were a part of. And then just continue to get better and better and secure a starting spot with the 49ers offensive line. And it's been a pleasure to play with you, Dan. But that Thank is you. our back. That is our bio on Dan's NFL stuff. And am I going into the background or? Yeah, are you, you are. I just feel the energy, man. You're really flowing. Just I'm here, let, man. Yeah, let, let it roll. Just let the George Kittle magic. Ooh, originally from Valley Center, uh, Valley Center, California. Yeah. Where you played with Valley Center Jaguars. Right. Let's go Jags. Love that. Where, all right, where is Valley Center as from here? 
from here. It's in uh, Southern California, uh, North County, San Diego, uh, just south of Temecula area. You know, like the wine country down there. Yeah. So, I mean, you're from, so you're from Southern, Southern California. You went to San Diego state. How far away was that from you? Um, it was only about like 45 minutes. It wasn't too far of a drive down. It was like That's more, uh, South. Yeah. Okay. I love that. So what was your favorite thing about growing up in Valley center? Uh, the best, best part of Valley center was, uh, definitely the small town vibes. It was a smaller town in San Diego. It was up in the Hills a little bit. So you go to the gas station, you're going to meet somebody, you know, uh, last time I went home, I actually ran into my, uh, one of my best friends, little brothers, uh, we were grabbing a burrito at the gas station. So uh, that was pretty cool. So that's one of the best things. You, every time you go back to town, you're you're bound to run into somebody, you know. Well, that's a blast. Yeah. Small town vibe. How far? Like, so, I mean, you're based, you're close to the ocean, right? Yeah, it was about like uh, 30 minutes inland. It wasn't too far. Uh, Oceanside was like the closest beach to us. So you just kind of go uh, west. Yeah. All right. I love that. Um, nice. Okay. How, how many siblings do you have growing up? Uh, I've got two older sisters. Okay. Now, between you and the two sisters, which one of you is the toughest? Um, I like to think I'm the toughest, but uh, my sisters are both really actually very tough. Uh, um, they taught me a lot growing up. They used to pick on me a lot, and then uh, it kind of just made me stronger. Uh, they both played softball for college uh, teams, so... Uh, and, you know, they were really tough and they were really good at softball. Softball oh, women, softball women are tough. Yeah, no, they, they're definitely tough. I mean, the, the things they go through, I mean, shoot, they become like, they slide into a base and they'll have like a burn all the way up their leg. You know, I get a little turf burn on my knee. I kind of get a little. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're underplaying us, Dan. You're underplaying us. We deal with a lot. <laughs> yeah. What position did they play in softball? Uh, my oldest sister, she was a catcher, um, and then a little bit of third base and outfield. And then, um, my other sister, she was a pitcher, um, and then played like second base shortstop. Nice. So between your family, sisters included, uh, what was one of the best or maybe the toughest lesson that you learned from your family? Um, the toughest lesson I would say it was from my dad. Um, you know, we always had chores growing up. So one of my chores was, uh, mowing the lawn and weed whacking. And generally you had to get that done if you wanted to go do anything. So I tried to get it done as fast as possible. And then, uh, you know, one day my dad came out and said, you can't do things half-assed. You got to finish what you're going to start. Um, and then that just kind of, and he just said that like in anything in life, doesn't matter whether it's just mowing the lawn or, uh, you know, playing football or anything like that. He said, you always got to do that. Um, and so then from then on, I, I started taking my jobs more seriously and then got things done the right way. Um, and so that was the, the biggest lesson right off the bat. Hmm. Attention to detail. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see then. Uh, so we jump into high school then played for the Valley Center Jaguars. We mentioned now, a little known fact. I bet a lot of people don't know this about you, but you played tight end in high school. Tall and yeah. mean and super twitchy, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I was a lot smaller then, so uh, it was it was nice. You know, it's 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 easier to you know keep your weight because that's your natural weight. Um, right. Versus now, you know, you got to beef up and always got to be on my weight, so I always got to be eating at something every okay. day. Okay, what's the favorite thing about playing high school ball as tight end, or just playing uh, tight end? I mean, tight end. Uh, the best the best part of tight end was uh, you know. I mean, you get a chance to catch the ball, but you also get to block, which is a lot of fun. Um, and so you, you're just kind of in there with big boys and, and you get to go get after D linemen. But at the same time, you can uh, go out there and get a touchdown. So uh, I think that was one of my favorite parts is, is just being out there is you're kind of you're in the, the trenches um, and you, you have that like lifestyle because the, the game in the trenches versus the game on the outside is completely different. And I love our receivers different. that block but it's definitely a different world in there. And so you get to, to be involved in that, but then also have the ability to go out there um, and get a ball and, uh, you know, kind of make a name for yourself. Okay. Now you being a former tight end, you've watched George on tape. Yeah. Give me, why don't you coach him up a little bit? <laughs> what, what are you seeing on tape that he, he needs to work on? 
Uh, you being a tight end. Yeah. Huh? Come on, give him a little hand here. So how were the gap schemes last week, huh? What do we got to oh, think? I love George and the gap scheme. I love the way George gets after guys. Um, there's, you know, the only thing is like a couple times, you know, just that inside step, you know, sometimes you got to get it down a little quicker. Those DNs sometimes hitting those gaps early. But uh, other than that, like, I mean, I love when George gets in there. Because, you know, not many tight ends get after it like like our guys do. Our team is very fortunate with uh, George, Ross, and uh, Charlie, the way they get after it. Um, not a lot of teams. Uh, the other, I think the other day we had another tight end, uh, the clip of them for the Bengals this week, and I was just watching them. And it's not the same as what our guys do. So it was, uh, it was awesome, awesome to see these guys go out there and uh, just do what they do and get after guys. I mean, there's always room for improvement. I get that. But I think we got some of the best tight ends in the league, especially when it comes to run blocking. You are mm. such a suck up. I can't believe it. But it's all it's all good. good I, mean, I mean, if you really Ooh. look at the guys in the league, our guys are some of the best there is. I mean, shoot, there's Levine, like guys that have been in this program, like Levine. I love. He's a beast. When you go watch him, I mean, there's there's some other guys out there, but like it's mainly guys that have been in the Kyle Shanahan system that you see that are the best tight ends blocking out there. Yeah. Well, it really makes a difference too. Watching, I'll just we were watching some college stuff over last weekend during championship weekend, you know, with all that. And then, well, not to mention any names, but there was a couple teams that we watch all the time, and their tight ends really struggling on the DEs. They were trying to run outside zone and stretch stuff and all that, and could not get it done. And boy, if you can't get that nine technique or the set, you know, if you're not getting that triple up, it, it yeah. makes for no matter what you do inside, it doesn't. You can't get any movement. You're kind of screwed. So, oh, yeah. okay, excelente. We like that. All right. And then let's see, awarded all league honors as a lineman your senior year. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then did you play any other sports that we should know about? You had some secret skill uh, set that we don't know? Um, the other sports I played in co- or, uh, high school were wrestling, volleyball, and lacrosse. So, you know, kind of just – I mean, I knew Ooh. football was my favorite, but uh, I like to keep it – keep busy in the off season. Um, can, we, can we take a little, yeah, can we take yeah. a little wine and talk about the volleyball career? Yeah, yeah. dude. I Man, love volleyball. Quick. Volleyball is probably one of my dude. more favorite sports for sure. Beach volleyball is my second favorite sport by far. Oh, like, no question. It's awesome. awesome. We, whenever we go to any beach ever, we have a volleyball net and we play anybody that will walk down the beach and try to play us. And me and my sister is so terribly competitive. Yeah. Uh, be- like, I know this about myself, like the nasty competitive side of myself comes out when I play volleyball and George and now Claire, like check me so hard. And they're like, Emma, <laughs> hey, Emma. you, you can't, you can't, but, but I have to like, flex, I have to brag on George a little bit because I played volleyball. And so all of the like different hey, you things and everything, George was always our ball boy and like would have to come to practices with me and like everything. And so George just like grew up knowing how to play volleyball. And so now it's like, I mean, truly one of my favorite, or even like when we were younger, I used to, when I would be like trying to practice, I would make George like throw the ball up and I'd like spike it back at him. And he was such a little sport, but now he's so good. And so I'm, I'm so proud of you, George. So proud of you. Yeah. Damn, we're going to have to play yeah, like, we're like, so what did you do? Like, was there a high school sport? Like, was it part of your high school? Male yeah, school? no, it was part of our high school. Um, the, uh, I would be uh, like either four um, like outside here, sometimes it was a middle, um, like early on when I first started, it was more middle because, uh, didn't really know how to, you know, play defense as much, um, as I got to play a little bit more, um, was doing a little bit for, and then, uh, my senior year, I did volleyball and lacrosse. So then I pretty much kind of got to play a lot more games than practice. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Because our lacrosse program was new. So, but they wanted, they yeah. needed guys to play. So it was awesome. So now, you know, Alec. Alex is a wrestler from his old days. Mac. Yeah. Alex. So have you two tangled a little bit? No, uh, no. <laughs> uh, I, 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 did, did, I, did, I didn't do wrestling as long. Um, okay. I, I wish I, I would have done that a little bit more because that hand fighting does actually kind of translate really good. a little bit. So uh, it would it would have been a – I wish I would have done that a little bit longer. But uh, I don't know. Mac, Mac's got some crazy grip strength. He can actually uh, – one of his talents is a phone book. He can rip in half, like just right here, and just rip it. It's kind of insane, but he can do it. That's tough. Alex Mackin. Yeah, you should you should ask him about it. If you have like a le- legit take phone a phone book, book take a phone book take to work tomorrow. Yeah, we need a little we're, phone book ripping. 
Real quick, who has a phone book these days? Nobody. 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 <laughs> I have, yeah, that's true. Nobody has okay, so, And secondly, why would he not share that with us? What a cool I don't know. I'm, I agree. We should have known that. So, Dan, when you play volleyball, though, do you serve overhand or underhand? Uh, overhand. I like to try to jump serve, but I was never good at that. That was one thing I wanted to get down. Um, and then a couple times, you know, I can get something in, but uh, generally I was not good at it. So I just kind of just did a nice little floater um, overhand, but that's usually how I do it. Yeah, that's kind of my style too. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Maybe, maybe all right. we'll all get to play someday. That would be fun. Oh, that would be a lot of fun. I love beach volleyball. It's definitely one of my top favorite things. Okay. All right, G, roll. Oh, on to the next one. Ooh. <laughs> how? Tell us. Oh, relax, Dini. Sorry. I'm eating. <laughs> I have dinner here, and Deanie's just being she's being a little brat. <laughs> um, how and why did you go to San Diego State? Like what? Like what? What was your thought process of that? Was that your top um, school? No, I mean I didn't really have any offers. So like my two choices was Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, where I was going to do ag business, um, and then uh, since San Diego State got me into the engineering program, I was able to do civil engineering there. I figured that was the best major going forward. So I chose to go to San Diego state and then also San Diego state's a pretty fun school to go to. So, you know, that was just a bonus on top. Who was the head coach then? Uh, Rocky long was the head coach when I was there okay. um, the whole right. time. Yeah. And did you, did you graduate in engineering? Uh, yes. I got my uh, bachelor's in engineering. God, man, we've talked to some, we've talked to some really smart dudes. Yes, yeah. that's crazy. We have, man. we have had some smart people on this podcast. It's crazy. Communications major, Dan. Communications and entrepreneurship as a minor. It is not an I had a couple of buddies that went through the, the engineering route. And out of like the four of my friends that did it, I think only one of them ended up finishing his football career at Iowa. The other ones like either quit football or they changed majors because it was such oh, a oh, it's just yeah, my dad's a, I mean <laughs> you know, Yeah, my my dad's a uh, he's a hydraulic engineer. And worked for John Deere oh, wow. forever. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. I wasn't quite sure. I, I was out after the first semester. I go, no, man, the pre-med chemistry and <laughs> all this shit. I was like, ah, not my deal. I just flipped over to business, and that was uh, that was a better fit for me. So yeah. I should have gone to education. But anyway, that was the way it goes. So, uh, okay, what's next, George? Are you rolling on that? I am. Okay. Um, you began your career as a tight end. Well, wait, let's right. tell us about the football transition, though. So, because, Dan, you're a really interesting kind of deal with – because when you went to San Diego State, you went as a walk-on, right, for football? Yeah, so I went as a walk-on, and then um, I was able to play for three years – or I redshirted and then played for three years at tight end. Um, okay. And then my senior year, we actually had a guy who was supposed to be the starting right tackle that year, um, and he got a blood clot, like, just before like the second summer session. Um, so they weren't sure if he was going to be even able to start the season or if he's going to be available at all during the season. Um, and so uh, the coaches actually, after one of our uh, summer workouts, um, pulled me into their office at, at the end of the workout and then kind of asked me if uh, I could switch over to right tackle. Um, they thought the way I could block and, and if I could gain a little bit of weight, um, that I would be best to, to fill in that spot with that guy going down. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to, you know, just be out there on the field. I want to play. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I didn't really care and I and just want to go win a championship with us. We had a good team, uh, a lot of great players that year. So we had a chance to do some special things that year. Um, so, uh, I, I took the opportunity and haven't looked back because it kind of worked out. Oh, and how much weight did you put on for playing? What were you playing tight end at during the summer? And what did you hit camp at in the fall? Um, I was about 250, 260 um, at tight end. And then uh, before camp, I think I got to about 275. And so that's what I was playing at. Uh, yeah. Wasn't able to what get a was, punch on. Or what was the weight lot or the weight gain process for like for you? Like, did you have a specific meal plan or was it like super clean or were you like just anything I can get in my body? Uh, <laughs> at, that point, at that point, it was like anything they can get in your body. I mean, I still okay. tried to not like eat like overly bad, but I mean, I'm, I'm not a person that eats super healthy either. Um, but I mean, a lot of the things I did that worked the best for weight gain was like peanut butter and jellies, like during, like in between it and out of meetings. And then you have your three meals during the day 
and then also like weight gain shakes to like before bed and stuff like that. Um, because I mean, there's still like good, like healthier options and then you can go to bed getting a good amount of calories. And so that was, a that was the kind of a plan. Um, and then like in the morning you take a protein shake and then, and go in. So, and that's what I did when I got to the league too, to, to kind of get to the 300 mark was to, to do it that way. So uh, we just used to do 21 piece KFC chicken dinner with all the fixings <laughs> one, one a day kind of took care of it. Right. With the no yeah. <laughs> that was kind of it. I'll do a line. We get done lifting and we all go down to the KFC right at the bottom of the hill in Iowa city. We'd all load up. Everybody go 21 piece family, full fixings. We'd all sit down with our own buckets and be there for about two hours. And then we'd leave. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh man. George, tell yours, yeah. tell yours though. What'd you do? Like uh protein powder and Gatorade? Oh, Dan. So like I had the worst time ever gaining weight. Like I got to college at two, like, like 197 and I got to 220, like going into my second year, I think like that. I think, yeah, going, no, going in. So I redshirted, I was like 205 to 210. And then the whole next year I got up to like 220 and then going into my red shirt. Well, my red shirt sophomore year, I got sick, lost 20 pounds. And I basically had to restart. And I like, I ended up gaining 40 pounds, 40, yeah, 40 to 45 pounds by drinking eight Gatorade protein shakes a day. Like Jeez. minimum. Like I had alarm set at 2 AM, 5 AM or 4 AM, like every two hours in the night, I wake up and chug a protein shake and go back to bed. It was awful. Oh, it's, that sounds horrible. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do it to that extent. I did like, you know, morning, afternoon, and then after workout, and then like, you know, midday some point, but not not, not to that extent. I always struggled with eating big meals. So I'd go like, I'd go to KFC, I'd get like a couple, like just like my own little thing of chicken, and then like a couple McChickens at night is what I lived off of. Oh, I lived off of two McChickens and yeah. uh, sweet sour sauce. So that was a Ooh. great combo. That and protein foods. Yeah. George, I, I remember those days though. Cause like, cause right now, like you're big right now, but you're so in your body and I feel like it's, it looks so mm-hmm. natural on you now, but like the process, like you were pretty beefy. I was dead. I was like, I was chunky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have photos where like all the weights just like right in his face. And just like, right here. His head's oh. like this big. <laughs> yeah. I, I got up to my senior year. I got up to like almost 265. I was a big boy. Oh geez, yeah. I feel like you have to you have to get the foundation, and then you can start kind of leaning it out. Yeah, it was. It was, yeah, that so. was a experience. Okay, more. Oh yeah, keep going. Oh, let's go to the next right. one. football. Uh, any? What were the biggest uh, kind of obstacles, or what you have to overcome going from tight end to tackle? So, I mean, that's a transition because tight ends typically don't do a lot of pass protection. They're you know they nip and chip a little bit, but not known for it. Um, it others, do, uh, well, I know. Well, I'm not even going to bring it up. We'll talk about it off screen later. But anyway, all right. Uh, but anyway, so what was the biggest transition for you there? What was the most difficult thing to get to? Um, it was definitely pass protection and, and just getting your sets and then like being firm in those sets because um, going from tight end, you're a little farther out. So you have a little bit more room for like when, you know, the guy beats you, you can kind of recover a little bit. Or if he's starting to bull rush you, you have more time to recover. And then as I've noticed, like, as you go in on the line, it gets worse and worse. Because, like, the amount of time you have to recover is just, like, kind of goes down and down. Um, well, so. your, your margin of error on a three technique on Aaron Donald is not very much. So, like, you know, if you got a three and a five over there and you're solo on that three technique, I mean, there's not if – you, if you take a bad step or miss, it's over. It's oh, yeah. city. You got nothing. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing for you. So that's really true. The margin of error for the interior guys, guard, center, and guard, um, yeah. interior A and you know B gap guys. It's it's a bitch. Yeah, uh, that's that's tough. Okay, all right. Then I'll wrap this up. So what's what was the best thing about attending San Diego State and being an Aztec? What was one of your favorite memories or favorite things? Um, shoot, there's a bunch of memories. Uh, I think when we won the championship was one of the best memories, just because a lot of those guys. We had been there a long time together and not a lot of guys left early. Um, and so like, it was our like recruiting cast that we came in together and we ended up winning uh, back-to-back championships at the end. So that was nice. Uh, but the, the best part of San Diego State, you can't beat the weather and then be able to go to the beach at, like after class was amazing. Like you can just, you know, get down to class, hit up the guys and then we're at the beach, you know, in like 20 minutes. So it's, it's not bad. Life's okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty good. I know I used to, when I was in college stuff, I recruited, I had a bunch of JUCOs in the San Diego kind of Southern LA, that Southern Cal stuff. And I'd go out there and a bunch of these coaches, they coach football and then they had like rec volleyball. They were, you know, that's their thing at these JUCOs, yeah. you know, and they're like, you can see the ocean from where they're at and all that stuff. And I go, I, I think I'm doing something wrong. I'm not, I'm not very <laughs> smart about this because these guys have this figured out a lot better than I do. So, oh yeah. Oh man. Shit, that's beautiful stuff out there. Okay. All right. Emmy, you up? Sure. All right. So transitioning into the NFL. Um, so not a first rounder. Welcome to the club. Um, we talked a little bit about the UFA. So could you talk a little bit about uh, making your first team and how that all went? Just the whole transition. And Dan, I just uh, put that just so you know, the last three guests we've had have all been first round draft choices. So, you know what I mean? So we've had this kind of elitist thing. They've been moderately humble, but you know, there's still this first round vibe, you know, they like to kind of be. carry yeah, so they got a little thing going. So anyway, so you're, you're certainly much more in our club. So we're welcome to that club. We're proud yeah. to have you on. So it takes a lot to do that. So anyway, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Um, so yeah, so I went uh, undrafted to Atlanta. Um, and it, it, was, it was definitely stressful because uh, like you have a bunch of guys. And that year we actually brought in, I think they drafted an O-lineman. And then they brought in a lot of undrafted guys. So there's a bunch of competition Um they were trying to find like little spots uh, in there with us um, young guys and they were trying to fill that. And so like it started off not a lot of playing time because I, I mean, I was transitioning from tight ends. So they were thinking of me as more of a development guy. Um, so kind of, I just had to earn your spot in. And then during OTAs, you know, you start playing. And, and once I got up to like the weight they wanted um, into like the 300 pound area, um, was able to get some reps and then just kind of, once you start doing good at reps, you get more reps, more reps. And then in camp, I got to be in there during preseason games and, you know, got enough in and made the practice squad. So I was kind of just happy with that to, to at least make the team. Because at first it seemed like, you know, all of us, I mean, I remember like us just talking about it early on and like watching like on the first day, I think somebody got cut. And so you see the, like how the business is like right off the bat. And so like you kind of go through those stresses right away. And then you see how many guys that there are out there. So then it was just kind of, you know, stick your head down and just go try to put as much work in as you can, uh, get the reps you can and do the best with the, the playing time you get. And so just try to build off that. And then to, to make the practice squad, that was a, you know, a blessing and, and the first step and to get where I was going. Um, so just kind of worked from there. So in that transition right so I mean a lot of uncertainty how like what was one of the biggest things that helped you to kind of stay grounded in it and focused or was it more like a mental thing or was there a physical thing that you were doing um I think it was just kind of a mental thing uh like like I said there's a bunch of guys and you look around and you can just look at the guys you know oh this guy's doing this this guy's doing that or you can kind of like look at it as like hey there's a bunch of competition you're going to get a limited amount of reps um everybody's going to get reps at some point and so you got to just do the best you can with those reps. So my, my biggest thing was just trying to get get the playbook down as best I could um, so I can go out there and play without indecision and go out there. Um, and then to just kind of focus on the technique that they're teaching and then do the best I can from there. Um, so just trying to do the most of the opportunity and not try to focus on all the guys um, out there and, and just try to keep your head down and go to work. That was kind of my plan. Was there a was there a player um, your first year or two that really was influential and in helping you kind of come into the league and you know level up in that way? Um, yeah, I think that going into Atlanta, they I mean Kyle Shannon had just been there, but uh, the way DQ and their staff did it very similar to how the Niners do it now, um, and and they had a good brotherhood in there. And the offensive line group that we went into was it was a great group to be in. And so those, all those guys was, was awesome. Like you get to the NFL, you see all these guys, you kind of wondering how they're going to react, like whether they're going to, you know, help to you or even if they're going to talk to you, you know, you're just an undrafted guy. Um, so then uh, all those guys were super helpful. And Alex Mack was there when I got there. Um, and then uh, Andy, Andy Levitre was also a big guy there that helped a lot. Jake Matthews, Ryan Schrader, um, all those guys were really helpful. And then they had some younger guys, uh, um, with Wes and Ben and they they I think that was like the best part was that group was so helpful all of them wanted to help everybody all of them wanted to make sure like each guy goes out there and does the best they can so I mean those guys would always if they see something wrong 
or if they see you struggling with something, they would definitely help out and make sure you know what you're doing and um, help you get to the, on the right page. So it was a great group to step into. I think that was the best part of that. Like going there was one of the, the best things was being in that group to be able to help you uh, learn the game and learn the NFL. With that transition then, what was the hardest, what was the hardest piece for you in it? Was it like the uh, mental stuff or like, I mean, I know you said like really studying the playbook, but you know, even like schedule or time management. Yeah, definitely figuring out your routine. That was one of their big things um, early on. And that's something that Dan Quinn preached a lot uh, was, was you got to learn your routine coming into the NFL. It's different than college where you just kind of go and you play. I mean, college, you still had a routine, but you're not really in that, that same as the NFL. And you just have to get in like the routine of, what you do pregame and, and how you study and stuff like off the field before, like um, the week before the game. And then also like rehab after and get your body right. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that you had to learn there. Um, and then like on the playbook alone, mentally, I mean, there's a lot to learn. So that, that was a big challenge because I mean, your playbook is definitely way harder than college. There's a lot more things you got to go through and it's a totally different playbook. Um, and then I think the game itself physically uh, the jump from college to uh, pros is huge. I think the speed of the game and the, the uh, strength of like everybody um, that might be a little different if I was in the SEC, maybe because those guys are a little bit more um, used to it or like the big 10, like you guys, you know, the co level of competition is a little different, but coming from the mountain West, there's a lot bigger jump. I thought the jump from high school to college wasn't even close to what the jump from college to pros was. Hmm. So. Interesting. What was studying the playbook at Atlanta harder than being an engineer? Uh, um, I think, no, nah, I mean, they're different things. I think they're both pretty hard. I, I think the playbook actually is like up there. I mean, if you ask an engineer um, if they knew a little bit about football and tried to study some, it, it is tough. There's actually a lot to learn um, in a NFL playbook. So uh, I think they was like, you know, most people even if like, with general knowledge of football would, would struggle. Um, I guess if it was a guy that didn't have any knowledge in football, they'd probably really struggle. But I mean, if you, if you kind of liked the game and you wanted to learn, it would definitely be tough for someone to learn. So I, I mean, I think they're different things. Uh, engineering might have a leg up because there's a lot to learn, but uh, I, I think the playbook's up there. I mean, it's not, not easy. Yeah. Excellent. All that right. Great. George, you're on. I'm on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. We're on, we're on the acquired by the yeah. Niners. Yeah. Acquired by the Niners in 2019. What was that transition like from going? Cause you were, you a free agent and then you went to AAF. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you're a practice squad guy, you have the chance to sign a futures after. And uh, I know my second year in Atlanta, I was, wasn't really going anywhere. It was just kind of practice squad. And I figured I was going to be practice squad again. Um, it didn't seem like I was getting elevated. Um, so I chose not to sign the futures back with Atlanta. And then I was hoping another team would grab me, but no other teams were really calling. So then I went to the AAF to try to get film and stuff. Um, and then when the AAF ended, the Niners called for a workout. Um, it was like my first call and, they, and I didn't have a team call for a little bit. So it was my first call. I went and did the workout, got the workout done, and then they signed me right after. So it worked out pretty good for that. That's sick. How was uh, – was it JB that did your workout? Yeah, uh, JB, Yenzer, they were out there for my workout, and then it was scouts, and then uh, I think Furster was out there. He, he was one of the first persons to say what's up to me. I think he was out there first, so I talked to him a little bit. Um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how that went. <laughs> I love that. Um so now Niners question for you. Yeah. So in 2019, you were thrust into starting at – you played right tackle pretty early on. Was that Pittsburgh? Yeah, so the Pittsburgh game was the first one I think I got a couple plays in, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, like you came in right I, at the end of that one, right? Yeah, Mike, Mike lost his shoe, and so I got to come in two plays. And the first play I think was like power, and we got a really good gain. And then so Kyle went turbo. And then we got another uh, gap scheme in right off the bat. Oh, I know. It's awesome. That was awesome. And then we went Pittsburgh. And then was it – went to the bye. And then maybe it was Washington or something after that. But Rams, Rams was my first game at tackle. The first start was Rams. 
Oh yeah, I forgot down in uh, down in LA at the USC yeah. Stadium. Yeah, that was that was um, that was wild. So I want to ask you. So you've played all the positions. You played tackle, guard, center. Um, give me one of your favorite things about each one, and one of your least favorite things about each one. And I know that your favorite thing about playing right tackle is playing next to me, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, tackle out on the edge. Uh... It's definitely nicer because uh, DNs are a little bit smaller, so that, that's a lot more fun to go against those guys um, in that way. But then also when you get onto the edge, the other negative is you got to go against a lot more elite rushers. Um, usually that's where the team's like best rushers are. Um, so those guys have tremendous talent and speed. So there's a trade-off. You get a little bit lighter guys, which is nice, but then also the, the speed ramps up, uh, especially if you get like a guy like D4 or those guys that can jump the cadence. Those guys are really tough to deal with. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what about guard? Um, guard, uh, I mean, when you got teams that, that don't have elite three techniques, uh, it, it's a little bit nicer um, because then you got you got guys that, you know, are going to try to just play their position, and, and then you can use that to your advantage a little bit. Um, and then I'd say the, the other turn, like hard part would be, you know, now you got bigger guys. So if you're not a bigger body and in Kyle's system, you know, we're a little bit lighter. Uh, so then you're going to get a lot more bull rush and stuff. So you'd have to anchor and it, it gets a little bit messier in there. And his guard, you get your legs rolled up on more and stuff like that. Okay. And center. Center. Um, center. I think I love center because generally a lot of the time you have a lot more help. Um, you do have some one-on-ones um, here and there, um, but you would, I would say centers have less one-on-ones in a game than guards and tackles throughout the game. Um, so generally you have help, which makes it a lot easier um, in that way. Um, but then also you have to deal with targeting everything and getting uh, everybody on the same page. And with NFL defenses, they're always moving around. Uh, and we like to motion a lot. So the picture changes a lot. So there's a, there's a lot going through your head. So uh, you're kind of, your eyes are scrambling a lot more. So. That's probably the toughest thing. I, that's what I was thinking. I, that's why I figured your answer was going to be help. Yeah. But there's so much more going on in your head. Now I got one more question for you because football wise, do you think that playing tight end and as being out on the edge from running routes, catching the ball and how you blocked that there, like that has helped your technique at all at guard? Because like, in my opinion, yes, I think you're obviously, I think you're our lightest offensive lineman, but I always think that you have quick feet and you always have like very good leverage on guys. And that's why you're successful. Like, I can't block guys without leverage. I'm 245 pounds. Like if a guy wants to pick me up and throw me, he can. So I have to have elite hand, hand leverage and shoulder leverage or I'm screwed. And I feel like you play similar to that because you always just seem like you're always running your ass off, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I think tight end definitely helps in that way. Um, and then I, th- I would say like another thing on top of that, um, what's great for this system and why I've been able to fit in this system being a former tight end is like uh, there's a lot of times where you have tough blocks where you have to get to the second level um, and be able to like kind of weave through there and, and catch those. Um, I think it helps you like mo- maneuverability wise, um, yeah. like to be able to maneuver in there. Like I mean, it gets messy uh, sometimes the way some defenses play. And so to be able to find your way through there, I think that's that help being a tight end um, because like some of those things you kind of got to get used to, um, especially like, I mean, you're used to it, like on running, running like nakeds and you got to get it like a shallow cross. Like there's a lot of bodies you got to avoid and stuff. Um, I think those things help uh, definitely big time. Dan, let me, what about, uh, you know, as a tight end, you have to recognize coverages and all that kind of stuff. And so like every time I've coached a line, you know, we make our guides, you know, like over the tight end tackle box, you know, we call it the triangle between whatever, you know, safety support and either the Sam or, you know, the walk backer and or defensive end, depending on the front. I mean, when you're at the guard position, are you guys watching, you know, the coverage role and how the linebackers are lining up? I mean, do you read safeties and all that? And was that, if you do, is was that made easier because of playing tight end? Um, yes, we do read safeties and stuff uh, um, from certain, depending on certain plays, it helps, um, especially like knowing whether a safety is going to be rotating down the back door 
whether your linebacker is going to be flying out of there or, right. you know, if they're going to be playing a little bit slower because the safety is not down there. So then they don't have any like backside help. So then they kind of got to play it a little bit slower. That helps. Or like for blitzes, um, that triangle like you were talking about, to be able to see that and where they line up, if they're lining up right. wider or not, to be able to see blitzes. Um, and then some defenses, the way they play, they'll have like linebackers out and then the safeties will fill in the middle. Um, so that, that, that helps uh, being able to recognize that. Um, I think that being a tight end that does help uh, be able to see some of those things um, and just the way some of our plays are, are put up there, it helps because you kind of do need to know a little bit of like two high or one high right. um, and yeah. see certain coverages in that uh, on some play. So I think that helps a big time uh, knowing those to just kind of get you in the right position. All right. Cool. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. How about a person in your life, and maybe, and it could be, it could be Abe Lincoln. It could be anybody. Okay. Just, but if you had a person that has inspired you in your life and it could be past, present or future or somebody, you know, or not know, but is there anybody like that, that you kind of earmarked and said, you know, that kind of helped you along the way and not personally, but just like their story kind of inspired you. Um, I think the two guys that, that helped me the most happened to be in my, my life. And I think they put me on the path of like, the perfect path for what I've gone through. Um, and just my high school coaches, the way, the way they went about life and the way they taught us, um, it was Rob Gilster and coach Cal, um, coach Cal was our strength coach and then defense coordinator for high school. And he got up every day at 5. AM and drove from down like downtown San Diego area all the way up to Valley center. So that's a 45, 50 minute drive. And he's getting there every day at 5 a.m. to open the weight room for all the guys to like breakfast club and to do that. And so they were um, they taught us a lot. And then my, my head coach, he had been he had played college ball before. Um, he's got a big stature guy and he always taught us how to play hard. And he's the one that kind of taught me a lot about football and to be able to learn like scheme and stuff like right away a little bit more than, you know, most people had learned uh, early on. Um, and so I thought those two guys combined just teaching me like the hard work and, and what to do um, to get to like where I needed to be. I think they set me up on the path to be able to go walk on play in college and then to, to get to the next level and go undrafted um, just the, the what they instilled in me in high school, I think was the, the way they ran our program and taught us. I think they were the two biggest things to get me to where I need to be. That's pretty cool. And I, I know uh, people, they hear and think about that, but I would say that too, even in my life, you know, one of the most inspirational people were two coaches I had back even in high school, you know I mean? Just that, cause it's so formative and between your buddies and your colleagues, but you know, somebody that's laying a path out and talking about values and how to do things right and all that kind of stuff. So, all right, well, that's pretty cool. All right, Emmy, this is your section next, the recovery restoration round table. It's a new, this is a what new segment. Well, we, <laughs> We've been kind of dancing around this. And so last time when we were on with uh, Lakin, we really got into this deep. And I thought it really made a lot of sense. We really uncovered I think, and covered some pretty cool ground. So I added this as a new section. So we hope our listeners enjoy it. So, Dan, don't screw it up. All right, buddy? Wow. All right. <laughs> Lakin, Lakin takes recovery to a whole nother level. Oh, he man. He, he, he reads books and everything on that. He, he's big in it. Yeah. He's pretty good. So, all right. Roll well, on. I mean, but – Either way, like you're in your fifth season and, you know, you've definitely learned some things, how to overcome injury, how to kind of sustain and move some soreness and pain through you. So what have you learned about recovery um, and kind of, can you tell us a little bit about your routine now? Um, so I've learned a lot of things in the NFL. It's definitely done a lot more than I did in, you know, college, college, you just do your like basic ice bath from time to time. Didn't do a whole lot. You do a little bit in the training room when you actually were injured. Um, but in the pros, you literally have to do it all the time. Um, it makes a big difference whether or not like how your body feels. Um, I think the, my routine, I definitely like contrast, um, in the tubs, uh, after games, after practice, um, for those things or after workouts, uh, definitely hit a lot of contrast. And, and so I like to get in the, start in the cold tub and you do about three minutes and then you get in the hot tub and you go back and forth for like 15, 20 minutes. Um, to get that contrast. And then you always end in the cold tub for me. Um, I feel like that's the best way to do it. Um, and, and those, I think, help, help with, like, you know, your blood flow and then and just helping your body feel good. 
Um, so those are some of the things I like to do for practice. And then I've been in at the Niners, I've been getting more into like the massages and the acupuncture um, after games. I think those definitely help. Um, I know Lakin's got his routine where he likes to get, uh, I think his acupuncture and then massage. Um, I haven't really noticed a difference in what, when the timing on those, um, but I definitely like getting the flush, uh, the massage that, that's big. And then um, I think acupuncture and like dry needling are definitely super helpful. Um, I like acupuncture for when you just need to spread. You got, you know, one area just kind of hurting from like your knee all the way up to your hip or something like that. Um, I like acupuncture to be able to get that spread out um, and spread it all the way. Uh, and then dry needling when I have a specific spot, like George uh, went to Jenny today um, and she does a little bit of like acupuncture dry needling uh, mix. And uh, I, I like that for when a spot, one spot is like specifically sore. Um, that's what I like to hit for those. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, so, and then with besides, cause those are obviously like very specific things, but mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of like keep limber or do you like have a, like a morning routine or something that you do to kind of get your body moving? Or is it maybe more like a pre-practice thing? Um, yeah, we have a group, uh, they, they, the Goski room with Elliot and Tom. Um, I like getting in that room. Uh, the it's, it's kind of like a, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it's like yoga and stretching and the it basically gets your body in the right alignment. Um, that's kind of the purpose of it. Uh, so it's almost like a chiropractor, but you're doing exercises to do that. Uh, uh, the best way I can describe uh, how, how they do it. Um, but I, I like doing that. And before the game, that's I usually have a routine that I go through um, to get that and, and get limber that way. And then after that, I'll go get dressed and then start in like a warm up. Um, and I don't like doing the warm up on the field of the, the team just because it's so far before the game. Like it's a few hours before the game. So I feel like you go out there, you sweat, and then you come back and sit down and get cold again. So I try to like do do the stretching, get loose, then go get dressed. And then I'll try to hit a like I'll hit a warm up in the locker room, um, kind of like a dynamic warm up. So that way, you know, you're kind of a little bit more warm right before you're going to go do stuff. So that way it's not as much uh, time in between. So you kind of just lose that that looseness, I feel like. You do, um, and so, go ahead. I was going to. You can go, Emma, please. Oh. Well, I was thinking, so, I mean, everybody's different, right? And so everybody kind of deals with injury in different ways. Is there like an area of your body or like something specific that has been kind of your Achilles heel in a way or like, and I guess, right. So George has always done, it's been like feet and ankle stuff. And so we do a lot of feet and ankle stuff, you know? And so for you, is there something specific that you've always had to be really mindful and aware of? Um. Luckily, I haven't had too many um, things uh, bad, knock on wood. Um, but uh, I think as like my career has gone on, uh, I think knees and shoulders for us is, is I think the biggest things. Um, that's where like the mo your more, most of your aches and pains come from your knees and shoulders. So I try to work on those and then strengthen those, especially in the off season. Uh, a lot of TKs, a lot of balancing things, um, get the knees going and then try to do some shoulder mo mobility stuff to, to try to get strength in your shoulders. Do you do anything uh, like in the off season extra? Like, cause I see like a physical therapist twice a week. You just like to work on whatever, like whether it's just cupping, stretching, random things. Do you do anything uh, in the off season that you don't do during the season or that's different? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll only see the physical therapist like this last se off season dealing with the AC injury. I would go see them for that. Um, but no, I haven't done it just to kind of do it to for like full body stuff. But uh, what I like is, I mean, what the best part is, is a lot of guys on Instagram show a lot of their workouts. So I actually kind of like just mooch off other people. So uh, mm. like I, lo I love watching you and your strength coaches. I get ideas from you guys. Um, and then there's a guy that was in Atlanta. He's now with Washington and he's a really big guy on, on, on taking care of his body. And he's been doing a lot of rock climbing. His name's Wes Schweitzer. Um, he, he's an old lineman and he can do like a bunch of rock climbing and like different hand positions. And, and he, like, it looks like it's definitely strengthening in his shoulders and stuff. So I was looking into doing some stuff like that, um, for, for like upper body because, uh, some of the stuff they do, it looks like it just really helpful for all that. And he's got great mobility now on his shoulders. And then 
great grip, hand strength. And I, I feel like that's a, something I might try to do. Hmm. Functional mobility. Yeah. I mean, doing things that's applicable because there's a big argument about some of the benefits of weightlifting and not. And I mean, you have to do some of it, but like how often do you lift 400 pounds off the ground? Yeah. You never do in football. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, there's this whole thing about, you know, hip movement and knees placements and feet and ankles and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, is it really functionally applicable to the game of football in a way? And there's a, there's a lot of new science out there. So it's a very, I think, dynamic and interesting time within the sport about really what training is going to look like for speed and strength and all those kind of things. So, and I think a lot more people are moving toward what you talked about kind of functional application of in process, in movement, you know, strength building and flexibility. So um, it'll be fun to see. Well, you'll have to you'll have to come back and give us an update on your when you climb some uh, you know scale five kind of thing and get off on it. That'll be cool. All right, yeah, like it. Well, so right, Emmy. and with um, right because obviously, so you guys have like access to the creme de la creme of taking care of yourself now. And the Niners are a really great organization within that, and like the whole holistic health and taking care of all your systems. So. But as like to give advice to a younger player or maybe somebody who doesn't have the same resources, is there a practice or like recovery or mobility thing that you feel like has made a huge difference or that people should focus on? Um, I would think I feel like yoga and Pilates are not a very expensive thing to go do. Um, And and it definitely I think those things are very helpful. Um, I feel like those are classes that you can get um, for very cheap. Um, and, and they don't, you know, only a few hours, like they don't really take up a lot of your time. I think those are some things like if you wanted to go do, um, without that. And then, uh, and then I would think like the the hot tub and ice tub, I I feel like that's really not hard for for someone to do, um, to, if they didn't want to spend a lot of money, I think those things are very easy things to do, um, and get in. Uh, and if you, if you're not able to do the contrast, the, the cold tub alone is definitely helpful to hit 10 minutes in the cold tub it would be like the next next best thing but if you have a hot tub and a cold tub if you could if you're able to do that and mix it the contrast helps um i think those things are are definitely easy things that i think anybody could do um for for not too bad and if you didn't even want to go um pilates you might not need be able to do because you need that table um but like yoga i mean you can look that up i feel like on youtube or like online you can definitely get uh, stuff to do like that to do at home. Uh, so I think those are some of the easier things for people that didn't want to go too crazy into it. Have you ever done hot yoga? Yes. And I don't know if I'll do it again because that was <laughs> crazy. I, I don't want to be, like, it's hard enough for me to do some of the stretches and stuff, you know, like mobility wise, being a bigger guy. Um, then to add another layer of me and just extremely hot during the whole time. Yeah. I don't That's know funny. about that. I've done that in power yoga and power yoga was also very, uh, that was, that was hard. (laughs) Yeah. It's, that's a whole different animal. Yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. Well, Well, and for those who need some yoga, Emma, is there a website that's available for some yoga? We have have a, we have a playlist on our, um, on our YouTube. So we have a bunch of free classes. Um, so if anybody's looking for that, um, okay. Last kind of round table question, LOL. Um, nutritional wise, how has what you eat kind of developed? Um, you know, talk a little bit about that and maybe the transition into, you know, taking care of your body through food. Um, nutritionally, I think that's one of the things that I could get better in. Um, I don't do as good, at all, but as an alignment and having to be able to put on weight, I, I can't just eat the healthiest of foods all the time and be able to like, unless I just ate like crazy, but, uh, um, so sometimes you kind of get a little bit dirtier in that field, but I, I definitely think the weight gain shakes are the biggest things. Um, and then to be able to like, that way you can get your spinach and all that stuff to, um, the healthier ways to do that. Um, and then there's your healthy fats that, that you learn, uh, and the best part of the Niners is our nutritionist. Uh, he's, he's awesome with what he does and helps us a lot. And I think he's helped me kind of learn some more into the supplement side of it. Um, and so, uh, some of the things I, I've been starting to do that's helped me keep weight on in the off season, um, like there's a Cytomax and, and other things like that you can drink, um, uh, before and after workouts, um, that help replace the calories that you burn during the workouts. Um, so that, I think that was big. 
Um, and then uh, some of the different like BCAs and um, like proteins that he has for us and, and the differences in proteins. He's kind of explained that a lot. Um, so I've been doing that more. Uh, and he, he's actually got a bunch of things that I've learned like nutritionally um, through supplements that can help you a lot uh, um, and get you going. And like just the uh, like the creatine that you take and things like that. Um, that's, I think, one of the bigger things that I've been doing uh, is just kind of supplement side of it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. George, you want to do the mindfulness? George, you're oh. muted. I would love to do mindfulness. Sorry. There's uh, just a little conversation in the background. I'm not trying to interrupt you guys. But mindfulness, awareness, and performance, MAP, something that my father and my sister do with Hidden Pearls. Um, what mindset have you used slash attained in order to walk on at San Diego State, ended up a starter, and then make it to the NFL for five seasons? And I'm not just saying like – or something that's helped you develop your mindset of – um, cause it, you know, when you're started off as a high school, then into college, like your mindset isn't right away. Like football is, you know, the most important thing, or is there anything that happened that like changed your mindset to make it more, uh, like, or centered around football that allowed you to be the player that you were, or, you know, I could be, I mean, that didn't happen for you. And you just always live your life. The way that's just always has how it has been, but just curious. Cause mine changed significantly throughout college. Yeah. I'm. I mean, I've kind of kept the same mindset and in my mind, mindset is kind of like just like the, you know, just blue collar worker, kind of put your head down, put your hard hat on and go to work. And my, my biggest thing um, is go out there and, and do what you can to the best of your ability um, and, and just finish which, what job you start. Um, that That's the kind of the mindset that I take into it and, and, um, my biggest things are, you know, I know I can learn the playbook the best I can learn as many plays, make sure I go out there and try to play without any indecision. Um, so that's some of the things I try to do, um, cause that makes a big difference when you go to a play that you know exactly what you're doing versus if you kind of don't know what you're doing. I think those are the ones that I think are, are the biggest things that I can control. And I try to do the best I can to make sure I don't have any indecision out there and, and then, uh, just go out there and fight. That, that's that's kind of the mindset I have is just kind of go out there and hard hat on and go put in work that I can and, and do it to the best of my ability. Well, this, see that that you kind of hit it on the head for me. I it took me a little bit, but once I realized that if you just study as hard as you can, you have no questions. It makes football a lot easier because the second that you have to think when you're on a football field about anything, like, when you have to mm-hmm. think, you or you're a step behind. And if you can get it to the point where I mean, whether it's our however many plays we end, like run plays, let's say we install 50 one week or 46 on just first and second down, and we have 25 pages of pass install, then you had third down reds, and like you have all these different plays, all these different scenarios, and the stress of football is enough, whether it's like a two-minute drill or whatever. But if you know exactly what you're doing on the play, and then all you have to do is think about whatever scenario that you're in, it just makes it so much easier. And that was one thing, like my rookie year to my second year, like that was a big, big change for me. I just studied my ass off as much yeah. as possible could. And I was like, I'm not like, because when you're when you come to line of scrimmage and you're like, oh, what? What was this? I mean, you're so screwed. And we've all been there. Like everyone yeah. has lived in that part. But it and that's just a terrible feeling. And you just gotta get really lucky at that point. Yeah, at that at that point, it's you know, that's that's where you see a lot of your bad plays happen is when those things happen. <laughs> uh, and like you said, like you got all those plays but on top of that, every play versus a different look, whether it's a different defensive front in the run game or whether it's a different coverage in the pass game. Like there, there's a lot of different looks that you get out there. And then you'll have those random ones that a team just kind of puts in that wasn't in the game plan or wasn't studied. And so, uh, you know, that's where you just kind of, <laughs> you got to just make a call and go with it. And so the faster you can do that, the faster you can just make a decision. I think, like you said, that's when you're going to play your best. So that. Dan, um, some of the other things though we do with the mindful program, mindful awareness, you know, we do, it's kind of a meditation, mindfulness space. We do a lot of breath work, um, work on visualization with people, affirmations and all that kind of stuff. Do you do are any of those practices part of your kind of weekly, do you sit around and do visualizations regarding gameplay or anything like that, or any of those kind of skills or tools that you might use? There are times where I do do that. Um, 
I, I hadn't gotten into that till just like more recently with the Niners when they had like the brain training room and the breathing and like a Gosku, they taught a lot about the breathing. And so one of my pregame things is definitely I'll go through like the playlist that like, you know, kind of like the top run plays and stuff like that. And I try to do like, you know, deep breathing through that to kind of, you know, like just in fill all the way up and then kind of out just deep breathing through that. And then I'll go through like kind of what I'm doing on each play and the looks I expect to get. And then that kind of like what footwork I'm taking and then kind of just go play it through my head, like how the game will go out. Um, and so that way, like when I go out there, that's kind of like the first things that come to yeah. mind. Um, so I try to go through that. And that's one of the things I do pregame um, definitely for trying to learn that. Um, and then the off season, that's some things that I'll do is like, I'll go watch film or pull up looks. And then I try to do that, uh, do that technique, uh, going through that too. Um, but I, I still, those, that's one of the fields that I've kind of been learning a little bit more and trying to add to like, you know, my routine and stuff like that. Um, he's, uh, it, I didn't start it till I got here and we had a room that kind of like took you through that, um, and taught you like the, the different ways of breathing and, and stuff like that. And then showed you like the results and stuff from that. And so that's some things, new things that I've learned and kind of added in. Yeah. Okay. Well, very cool. All right. All right, George. Did you, did you tell Dan about the fashion preview? Uh, I mean, He's never I, on us to tell them. We tell you this every single week. Make sure you tell the player about the fashion segment. I you told you literally them. same conversation every no, no, week. No, 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 no. But you usually tell them once they log on, like, hey, Dan, did George tell you this? And you guys didn't say anything, so I figured that you already done it by the time I got on. I was on last. Dan, I was on last. So part, of, part of Hidden Pearl's podcast, we do a fashion segment, which is it's a fan's favorite segment. Um, and what I do, I just show off like a pair of sneakers that I'm fond of or I just purchased or I'm going to wear at the game this week. So like last week, Lakin showed off one of his suits that he likes to wear to games, like one of his favorite suits. But like just something that's like part of your game day swagger. Um, I don't know if you have a pair of shoes lying around that you like or a shirt or you can, uh, <laughs> or you can just talk about it, like what you think like every Sunday because you're not really a suit guy. No, no. I mean, you know me. I'm the I'm not the, the most fashion type guy on the team. I'm very uh, – it's regular, uh, regular old me. I think I show up in mostly the same things every, all the all the time. I don't really change it up much. Um, game days, I like to keep it, you know, nice and simple. You know, nice, nice pair of jeans, uh, and then a nice little button down. If it's cold out, you know, I'll throw on a flannel or like you know a Levi's mm -hmm. jacket. Uh, um, but I don't, I don't get too crazy. I don't, I'm not not super big into that. Uh, I like my pair of shoes, like these, they fit really, you know, comfortable. So I don't change up the shoes a lot. Um, I think my biggest thing is, you know, just a, a good pair of jeans and then, you know, nice little flannel. I'm a big flannel guy. So. I love All right. <laughs> what's your, what's your footwear sweat? What, what shoes are you, what's your favorite? Yeah, what, what are your comfy shoes? Uh, the comfy ones, I got these uh, like Nike uh, Janowskis. Um, they got my insoles in them. So they fit like, you know, just right. And, fit great i do mix it up and put like you know, i'll put like some air jordans on every once in a while um those, those don't feel as good i'm not uh i'm not used to wearing those all the time <laughs> they're good enough man yeah but they look good i love that well all right this week uh, i'm gonna keep, keep on the sneaker train um actually i wore these ones today i felt nice and i was wearing i was wearing a nice colored hat and so i thought i'd match it with the shoes um, oh there you go. Go. All right. these are these are the dunk lows I'm on like a big a bit of a dunk low fix right now. Um, I just love them. Uh, I think they're super comfy. They're easy to put on. Like I never have to, this is how you buy them with this loop and you never have to untie them. You just slide your shoe right in. And it slides right in. It's nice and snug. I can put my insoles in these too. I got those because those are phenomenal. But I've been a fan of these and I, it's like, it's just different. Kind of looks like a Carhartt boot. What are those called? These are Nike dunk lows. Dunk lows. Oh. Dunk. Okay. So like the normal dunk highs, it just has, they go up to here and these ones are just cut off the ankle. These are awesome. They're very yes. easy. To cut off. Yeah. And they got, those are beautiful. Colorways. I've showed a bunch of dunk lows before, but those are, those are the ones I, I wore today. Big fan. Well, so Dan with your insoles, uh, first, what type of insoles do you use? And then do you ever use correct toes or toe spacers? Um, I have used toe spacers. Uh, um, I need to get better at using them. Uh, but uh, I, I do like uh, doing toe spacers from time to time. The insoles I have, um, I don't, I don't know ex specifically ones, but uh, for a lot, I had a stress fracture in college, 
And so then I went into see a foot doctor and then they kind of got me the right arch and, and insoles that you need. And so then like every time I've been in like the NFL, I'll make sure to get like a different pair of insoles as like I go um, because like your body will change and stuff like that. Um, just to make sure you have the right arch support and stuff like that. Um, Cause I know my dad's had like flat feet before and stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> I think that, that's stuff that I like to have. And I haven't had a stress or like any problems with my feet since I've gotten the insoles. Um, so I think they definitely help. So I try to keep those all the time. Um, make sure I have, have those in my shoes. I wear them in my cleats. I wear them in my walking shoes. Um, and then in like, I, some shoes, I don't put them in like a dress shoes or shoes that I won't be wearing like very often. Um, those are the only shoes I probably don't wear my insoles in, but like my average day walking shoes or like cleats and stuff, stuff that I'm wearing all the time. I definitely have my insoles. Cool. Cool. Okay. I love talking about feet. Yeah. Yeah. We like feet. Okay. Then I'll just do a quick summary. Let's do a little football and then we'll talk about uh, community service stuff. All right. Niners six and six freaking lost to Seattle up in that fucking piece of sh- stadium 23 to 30 with the seagulls flying all over us after we were leaving. I thought they were going to swoop down sons of bitches. Okay. Anyway, we already talked about it. Six and six still in control of the destiny. We get to 10 wins. We're I think for sure in. We just got to take care of business. We've got plenty of opportunities coming over these next weeks. Playing the Cincinnati, Ohio Bengals, home of former tight end, Niner tight end, Garrett Selleck. Selleck. Yeah. The Selleck's going to be in the house next week, so we're excited about that. I thought we should, probably should have had him make a cameo on this damn thing. Anyway, all right, 7-5. and five. They thought they were on a roll. They had a two-game win streak. They lost to the Chargers last week, 22-41, to down 16-0 at the first quarter, kind of fell apart, tried to make a rally. Chargers buried them. So history, teams have only played 16 times in the history of the NFL. What about that? Two times in the postseason. Niners lead the season series 12-4. to Mm. Been a whooping, although over the last six games, again, the teams are three and three. Niners had a huge edge there for a while. All right. Last game uh, was the Niners in Cincy in the 2019 Super Bowl. And Niners put a pretty good whooping on them. But that's a long time ago. And the teams are very, very different. All right. Big note for them. They swept the Steelers this year for the first time in about a gazillion years. They're feeling pretty good. They've got some quality wins, but they've stubbed their toe a few times. And we know how that feels. Anyway. Last week, gave up six sacks and 11 QB hits against the Chargers team that is about 28th in pressures and sacks. So, not Joey sure what's Bose going on. Good, though. Joey Bosa is very Joey good. Joey Bosa is really good. Yeah, yeah he good. came after it. So, anyway, they got after him pretty good. So, I know it's early in the week for you guys, although a little bit. So, it's a Wednesday and we're recording this. So, you know a little bit about them. So, uh, I'll just toss it up. Anything you want to offer? Who are some guys we should look for or anything you're expecting out of this game? Um. I mean, I think it's going to be just a hard nose game against these guys. I think these guys want to bounce back from their loss, um, and we definitely want to bounce back from ours because it's just uh, embarrassing that the Seattle game, um, how they've been getting after us the last couple of years. Um, but uh, I think, I mean, they're going to play a front. Uh, they're going to sometimes have six D linemen out there or, or five D linemen and then a linebacker um, on the ball. Um, so they're going to have a lot of guys in the front seven up on the on line of scrimmage. So I think that's going to be the biggest test of this game is how, how you take care of that line of scrimmage going forward. Um, and, and if you can get past that line of scrimmage, then, you know, with all those guys up on the line, it, it's going to be interesting to see how you get into that back back four or get, get past those guys. Um, if you can get some running lanes, uh, the amount of room you'll have back there. So I, I think that's going to be the biggest test this week um, is getting past that line of scrimmage. Um, with all the guys that they're going to put up there and they're going to devote to the run. Um, they, they have a real good run defense, um, I think, uh, ranking and stuff like that. Uh, George's fourth, I think that's what they've been telling us today. Um, so they, they play hard, um, hard football, and they're going to have a lot of guys in that front seven. So I think that's going to be the biggest test, um, especially as an O-lineman uh, up front. Um, and if we can get past that, then some of the things we'll be able to do to, from there – would be huge, and I think that's going to be the the main point of the game. Yeah. Okay, so I, identify. I agree, yeah. I agree with you there, Dan. I I think just watching, um, so just following along all year because one Selleck's there and Trent Taylor's on the team, and so I talk to him every once about once in a while about it. But their offense can put up a lot of points. They have a good quarterback. Um, they have good wide receivers that can make explosive plays. 
They got our guys, CJ Yuzma and um, Drew Sample, a tight end, two guys, you know, Tiaden University graduates. So I got those boys there. Um, so I'll be fun to see them. But, like, they got some weapons, guys that can make plays. Joe Mixon's a wonderful running back, too. Um, Pretty tough. He's, yeah. he's, he's fast, he's decisive, and he's hard to tackle. And that makes a really good running back. Um, so um, I'm excited to see how our defense responds to him. And then uh, one thing I do love about playing the Bengals, I get to play one of Bosa's buddies, um, Sam. Uh, I think Hubbard is his name, his last name. But uh, I, I like playing the Ohio State guys. It's fun for me. A little Big Ten battle out there on the edge. I'm going to enjoy that. And um, but yeah, no, they they got good guys in coverage. But uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be a fun physical game. Um, we're going to make it that way. Uh, I think we've done a great job all year playing physical. We just got to clean up with some things like turnovers, um, you know, big plays, eliminate some of those, eliminate some uh, mistakes. And but we've been playing at a very physical level all season. And so I'm excited to bring that to Cincinnati. Can't wait. Can't wait. So we'll be there. We will be in the stands hollering and yelling and cheering and doing whatever. So that'll be Make pretty sure cool. Spill, spirit, spill some Bud Light on Garrett Selleck for me. <laughs> I will. I'll pour one over his head. The little shit. Okay. All right. Let's wrap it up by service and giving back. So, um, so part of what we do with the Hidden Bros podcast is uh, we do a, some other shows, but we this year we're hosting. Uh, it's really a focus on veterans, and so we're we're partnering with a group called Merging Vets and Players. And so we host uh, the second part of the show uh, is with a veteran, and this week it's with Adam Clark. He's out of Cincinnati. He's a big Bengals fan, so we'll be sending him to the show. But he's going to be on. He's another uh, Army Green Beret Special Forces guy, so we're excited to have that. And then again, this week we're sending six additional members of the Ohio National Guard to the to the game as well, just to, to honor that. And we've done that each week. So, uh, but just trying to give back. So veterans has been our focus, but we also then we donate to the charities that the MVP veteran suggests. And so usually it's either one or two of them and we split the money and do that. So just kind of checking in, um, what's the role for kind of community service in your life, you know, giving back, uh, whether high school, college or whatever. And I, so I just looked up a few things. So the uh, Niner stuff got you on for my cause, my cleats, uh, wishes for warriors, the Vietnam veterans. It sounds like you had an uncle that served I'm, I'm something like that. Um, and then also melanoma research, sounded like you had a cousin or two that had some of that stuff going on. And then also you went to Budapest in February 220 with, I think it's called American Football Without Barriers or something like that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so those are a couple of things I found. But do you, so tell us a little bit about kind of service in your life and because obviously you're committed to some of these things. And do you have an organization or anything that I didn't mention that you want to mention that you're passionate about? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's one of the best things um, that I wish the college game, and I know Iowa does a great job um, with that hospital right there, I, I, and creating the wave is huge, and I, I think college teams can do such a great job, just like NFL teams, um, in doing that, and in college, we had some opportunities, they had the Dr. Seuss uh, reading across America, where you can go in and read um, to, to elementary school, or preschool, uh, or, or kindergarten, and stuff like that. Um, and go read Dr. Seuss books. So that's some of the things I tried to sign up for. Um, we had another one where you, uh, Junior Seau's uh, group, uh, where you take kids shopping in college. Um, so I think that was big. Um, those are some things that I just love to do uh, to help out the community. And then um, in the pros, I think what the best thing is that they actually have a team just devoted to it. And I think with college, with how much money they make, I feel like that's something they, they should definitely add yeah. to each team because – I think it's very beneficial and helps a lot of guys, um, you know, just get into that. And then I, I know there's a bunch of guys that have plenty of things that they, they're devoted to and, and want to serve. Um, so I think it'd be a great thing to add. Um, but in the NFL, it, it's amazing the, the teams we have that set up that. Um, and then this year for my cause, my cleats, I did a TR4 Heart and Soul. Um, it's a group in North Dakota that uh, I've got to see um, so my sisters know um, and are friends with, and, and they, they take uh, people with disabilities and um, take them on horseback and, and do therapeutic things um, with horses to, to kind of get the kids more involved and, and, and more interested in doing a lot of things. And, and they love it. And I got to meet some of the kids and it, it's pretty cool right. the process that they do and how they're able to incorporate horses and, and, and help with that. Uh, and so that was one of the big ones that I did this year. 
And then and the, the ones in the past that I've done, uh, definitely Wishes for Warriors is a great group uh, um, for wounded warrior uh, guys that, um, you know, whether it's mentally or physically uh, have had, you know, wounds. Um, they take them on hunting trips uh, and, and fishing trips and take them out to do outdoors things mm. um, to also let them know, like, you know, those guys are there for them uh, and, and want to help out. Um, so I thought that was an awesome group of guys and I, I've got to meet them and, and do a lot of things with them. So I, I, I love working with that group. Um, and then, yeah, uh, with the, uh, the melanoma research and, and Vietnam vets, uh, my, my, my uncle was a Vietnam veteran. Um, so I always like, uh, veterans and, and want to give them as much support as I can. And then, uh, with cancer research, uh, I've had multiple cousins, uh, um, that have overcome melanoma and, and people that have done that. So, uh, uh, I have one cousin that's battled melanoma, lupus, uh, breast cancer, and, and she's still going. So that's, uh, she, she's done a lot. So uh, I always try to, to support those researches because, uh, definitely big, uh, for my family. Well, very cool. So, okay. Well, I, I, I want to ask a question. Have you ever done, right? So the horse therapy, have you ever done equine therapy before? Um, no, I mean, I, I went with them, um, and, and one of their, one of their patients, I, I kind of did it with their, uh, some of the things that she went through, but I didn't go like as in depth as, as what they do. Um, but I, I thought it was one of the coolest things in the world, just seeing, uh, seeing how like, um, she's a, one of the girls, I have a picture, she's in a wheelchair and, and, you know, she's not able to do a whole lot and the, for them to be able to take her out on a horse and then go through different things like exercises to do stuff. Uh, I thought that was one of the coolest things in the world. Um, because how much, how much she had, how much fun she had doing it. And you could tell like, that's what probably her favorite part of the day is to be able to go do that. Um, I thought it was really cool. Like how you're able to incorporate those things together. Definitely. And so one of our, um, one of our good friends, um, who's been like a really big mentor of mine ha does equine therapy. So she's a shaman yoga teacher has done a lot of equine trainings. Um, but Lori Higgins curly, uh, shout best. out, um, big old, big old shout out Dove Creek ranch. Um, but if that's like, so as people are hearing this, right? Like, so we always like to kind of pinpoint like the different therapies and stuff, but if you love horses and you've never done an equine therapy session, like 100, like I can't recommend it enough. Just the level of depth that a horse can go with you. And so a horse's energetic heart space is five times bigger than a human's. Larry's explained it to me a bunch of times. So if I'm butchering this, Larry, I love you. I'm sorry. But so when you enter into their space, right? So whether you're on horseback or you're just standing in the arena with them, they like bring you into their auric energetic field. And if you've ever, if you've ever been around a horse, like they have some serious energy. And so like, you can just feel it right when you step into the, like, to the space with them. And so what it does is it like, it helps to align you with this just higher Bruce is laughing at me, but just this no, no, higher no, no. level of like being an energetic space where it's like, they're so calm and clear and have no agenda. And it's like for any like PTSD or trauma or like, there are just so many benefits to it. And so if this is kind of like sparking anything for anybody, like 100% recommend checking it out because I feel like it's something that not many people know. Right, George, you love horses. Yeah, no, terrified of horses. So any suggestions to avoid that at all costs? Yeah, get in their pin with them and talk to them. Hey, I did overcome my fear. Uh, I have not been on a horse for probably 12 to 14 years. And this off season, while we were in Utah with some friends and I did a horseback ride up like while well, you some Utah, like small mountain and came back down the other side. I was on a Clydesdale too, which was sick. Like that's my one exception. Ooh. Like Clydesdale horses. It was like a hybrid Clydesdale yeah. and she was a big mama and she carried me like it was nothing. And I felt cool. Cause I was obviously on the biggest horse and Trent Taylor was obvious on the smallest horse. <laughs> 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 but I was a huge like, and, but I was still like, and I was here, but like I was mildly nervous the whole time. I, Dan, when I was a kid, I took two hoods of the chest and threw me into a barbed wire fence, and I like, was yeah. not, and so like I've always just had a mild trauma when it comes to horses. I mean that that that's understandable. I mean when you when you go through that, I, I could see it. But I mean, I definitely, uh, I love being around horses. I, I think you should uh, definitely kind of overcome that one a little bit, because especially like trail horses and stuff with how mellow they are and calm. Um, and they're so used to going on those trails. Uh, I think those are definitely something you should try again because like, or like, like you have, but, uh, to maybe get into more piece. I mean, they're, they're, they're actually a pretty, 
interesting animal and, and they're a lot of fun to, to, to go out there. So I agree. I agree. Right. They are cool. All right, um, Georgie, oh, love that. Georgie, you want to close us out there? All right. So Dan, the last part of the show, and then we'll let you get back to your lovely Wednesday evening. Um, something we like to finish with is hope on the show. What is something that has given you hope, uh, whether it is this week, this year, something that you're looking forward to. So like we use Thanksgiving as examples. I used fans being back in the stadium as an example that gives me hope. Um, like, like this is, I, I, I will, you know, lead it off. Something that gives me hope is um, we're, my national predators are having one hell of a season right now in the NHL. Like I feel Forsberg, uh, came back from a pretty nasty concussion that he got from his own teammate. He had four goals in two periods. And just to see my guy back out there overcoming, a, like, because, you know, concussions are scary. Like, they're not fun injuries. But to come back from that, and then he's playing at an incredibly high level, uh, just gives me hope that, you know, or just makes me feel good. And it, you know, warms my heart that he's uh, just out there kicking ass and taking names as an absolute savage hockey player. And it inspires me to play at a higher level. Yeah. Um, some of the things I definitely say give me hope. Uh, my family, they're always texting me before the game. Uh, family and friends, they, they are always hitting me up um, saying uh, good luck this week and, and great game after. Um, I, I love them. And, and then my nephews, they always send me a, a great video before the game uh, to go get some pancakes and stuff. And, and so I love those guys. They always give me hope. Uh, uh, that's big. And then the, one of the other things that gives me hope uh, and you probably don't realize it from my reactions, but one of my favorite things is in the locker room, having your locker next to me because you got so much dang energy that you're always, you know, saying, what's up, Dan, how are you doing this morning? And so uh, those always give me hope just to get me started in the day. I love that, Dan, because sometimes you just kind of look at me and don't say anything. I'm just like, I'm just going <laughs> to keep saying No, well, you're hey, the one that I, gets me going I, in the morning. I love that because I, yeah. I swear to God, Dan, I do have to toot your horn just a little bit. I have never seen someone watch as much film as you watch. Never, like, whether it's, like, in meetings or out of meetings, whenever I come to my locker, you're on your phone for about 10 minutes, and then the next time I come back, you're watching film. Like, whether it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I just always see you watching film. Just watching the linemen, how they move, how they're reacting to things. And I just, I, I respect the hell out of it, because I love knowing that someone on lining up next to you is putting that much time and effort into it. And so... So I want to let you know. Thank you. And that also gives me hope. And also t- reminds me that I need to watch more films sometimes. Like I'll probably do after this. You know, just the Dan Bunko uh, inspiration. <laughs> Appreciate it, Jordan. So, Dan, I'm just going to use uh, your story. You know, I, I love these stories about walking on, you know, making it and then the transition undrafted. You know, I mean, and I don't know that, you know, people kind of sit around and go, OK, he did it. But, you know, it's still you know, like not being very well recruited because, I mean, in truth, Georgia wasn't, you know, big out of high school, you know, it was the military academies or Weber State, you know, and then Iowa called on the very last day, you know, the night before. So, um, you know, we kind of been down that road. And so we were really grateful for that. Um, and then, you know, we got drafted in the fifth and all that. But I, I, I think it just takes a different breed to be able to put, you know, the naysayers and all the negative voices in your head that could be there all the people that have told you you can't do it and all that kind of stuff and to still show up, buckle up. And then, like you said, just put your head down and do the very best you can and have the confidence to put yourself out there. And so I think it's such a great and inspirational story, you know, and it can, it crosses over into all things, whether somebody's trying to write a book, start a new business, whatever it is, you know, if you have a dream, uh, even if, you know, you may not be the poster child for getting it done, you know, if you want to work for it and are willing to bring the energy and just put your head down and keep working at it, take those small steps, right, George and Emmy, uh, you never know what can happen if you just believe in yourself and keep going. So I think that's super inspirational in the story. I think a lot of people hopefully are inspired by this holiday season because it's a little bit of that season as well. You know what I mean? It's about, you know, nobody was supposed to survive and it wasn't you know, going to be any big deal. And it turned out to be a pretty big deal. So anyway, so a lot of hope there. And I really appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, and sharing that story with us and the tips that you shared as well. So great job. Um, and just your evolution into being a professional football player, you know, cause it is, it is an evolution, you know, and there's a lot to learn and a lot of growing edges. And if you're not growing and learning and taking care of your body, you won't be around very long. As you said early on, you know, it's a business. So anyway, so thank you very much for that. So thank Emmy, you want to close? Me. Anything else, Emmy? Or are you going to save yours for our vet? Uh, I'm going to save mine for the next one, but um, it was great getting to know you, Dan. Thank you so much for yeah. being on the show. Super Thank you guys great. for having me. This is awesome.
All right. Well, you take care. Let's get one over in Cincy. We'll be up there. We'll try to throw an apple or something at you to get your attention. See what happens. All right. All right, G, you have a great week. It'll be great. All right. Thanks, Pops. All right. Thank you. you. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, guys. Welcome to the next segment of our podcast. We are super excited to have as a guest another MVP member, this time from Cincinnati and a huge Bengals fan. Uh, Master Sergeant Adam Clark. So welcome, MSG Clark, and thank you so much for being with us on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure. I do appreciate it. You know, uh, I am I was a staff sergeant, so I don't want to uh, overstep my boundary. I, my, I think my team sergeant would kill me if he saw that. So just a little correction there. Well, is, is MSG, isn't that Master Sergeant, or what is that? That is Master Sergeant. So that would be uh, a.k.a. Team Daddy. Um and then uh, you have guys like me who ran radios and uh, on the team that was more like a staff sergeant. So, uh, okay. So he knows. We'll get that clear. I have to say, for um, I know we were kind of talking about all the different acronyms and everything, but for our last show, our guy gave us so much stuff and it was really interesting. But I had like a full on vocabulary list <laughs> lined out for it. And I was like really trying hard. It is to a whole new it. language. It's a whole new it is, it is. social structure. It's uh, it's a different world for sure. OK, well, cool. Well, so um, so are we good with Adam? Is that OK? Yeah, that'd be great, actually. OK. All right. So we know and as we we're just talking about, so we. You know, sometimes we get the army bio, the whole military piece, all that. We didn't get that, so we're just going to start at kind of the beginning, if, if that's okay, sure. and not intentionally overlooking anything. So, if you want to add anything as we're going, but so generally we kind of just start. You know, where'd you where'd you grow up, and what was your kind of home life? You know, your family situation. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I think I was a Bengals fan since the moment I came out of the womb. Uh, I had some young parents, and uh, I was lucky enough where. Though they were single parenting when I was growing up, right around when I was eight or nine years old, they got married and uh, yeah, we had a pretty solid life. Uh, they, they sacrificed a lot for me. Um, you know, growing up, I had a you know, grandfather who was in the Marine Corps as well, uh, certainly sat on his lap a number of nights watching you know, war movies like Green Beret and uh, John Wayne out there just kicking some butt. You know, I think that uh, you know, it still is in the brain and you know, led uh, a lot of my inspiration and just the discipline and all of that. Um, but, uh, you know, I went to high school at Mason high, uh, Mason high school in Cincinnati, Ohio, home of the comets. Um, yeah. I went comets? To the, the comets. Yeah. So like a flare across the sky, a flare across the sky. Yeah. Nice. Did you guys yeah. have like a live mascot that walked around, like looking like a comet? Uh, it was actually a guy that dressed up in like a race suit. Uh, I don't know what the logic was, I guess, cause he's fast. Comets are fast. You know, so it all kind of worked out. But and we were green and white too. So, you know, you think if you're going to be comet, you're going to be like, you know, black and fiery like the Bengals, you know. But, um, but no, that's uh, neither here nor there. But, um, you know, as as I was going through high school, I wanted to play football in college. I ended up going to Wittenberg University, a small D3 school here in Ohio, played football for about a year and a half, and then transitioned over to rugby. Really wasn't finding a whole lot of satisfaction. You know, I I had tossed up going into the military or going in uh, to college and end up college route. But uh, I just remember waking up, you know, I had gone in first. My freshman year was when 9-11 happened. I had a couple of friends go into the military and it just felt like it was my time. It It was my time, you know, seeing those buildings fall, like watching it live on TV. And we're close to Dayton, Ohio as well. So there was, uh, you know, there was aircraft all over that day. You got Wright Patterson Air Force Base here. Um, you know, people are flying in, flying out. And it was about a year later where I just thought, you know, it's it's, it's time. And I, I woke up, I shaved my scraggly college face, walked on down to the recruiter's office. Um, they had this big cutout of a Green Beret in there. And you know, I just went in because I wanted to sign up. And um, I was like, I want to do that. How do I, how do, I do that? I want to want to participate in that, you know, and I'd heard it was you know one of the hardest things to try and not having a lot of satisfaction. I was not doing well in the, in the classroom uh, for a number of reasons, but just I wasn't interested in sitting and behind a computer. I really wanted to get out and make a difference, um, you know, kind of you know, use that physical energy a little bit um, and also you know, gain some of that discipline that I knew that the Army would give you as well. 
Um, I didn't tell my parents. Um, so I signed, I signed that day, which kind of leads to a whole nother process until you're officially in, but you know, they gave me my printout, what my job is going to be. And I signed up for the 18 x-ray program, which is basically you can come off the street and try your special forces recruit is your MOS, but you have to go through the program. And uh, I took the contract home. I showed it to my parents and, uh, yeah, they, they were flabbergasted. They were just like, what are you doing? What, you know, why, we, why would you do this? And I was like, well, not only did I do this, but I also dropped out of school today. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a whirlwind of about a week. You know, my parents were pretty upset, and, uh, but not, not upset because I was serving my country. I think they were just a little upset that, you know, here I am, you know, 19, 20 years old, still in this phase of do I consult my parents or am I a man now? Do I make my own decisions? What do I do? Um, I couldn't be more happier uh, that I did it and, and went in, you know, went to into basic training. Uh, and that was, you know, that's where I met Nate Boyer and some of the other guys that, you know, uh, we both sort of know and um, went through the, uh, went through basic, went through airborne school, uh, made it into the Q course, made it through selection, small unit tactics. So, and if you're not aware or haven't heard, uh, Green Berets, their specialty is guerrilla warfare. And that was also an aspect that kind of really appealed to me. I'm sort of an unconventional guy. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I, you know, we started a business here. I've never really done anything the way everyone should tell me. And when I do, I there's this like fire inside me that just kind of blows that traditional path apart. Um, and then I got to recover and go follow my heart. And so, you know, that's what I did. I became, a, I was a, a 18 Echo, basically a communication sergeant on an, on, on an ODA. I was on ODA 5413. Uh, we were stationed out of Fort Campbell. Uh, we deployed to Iraq. That was our main theater of choice uh, for us at the time, mainly the Ninwa province, which was up in the northern part of Iraq. And I was on specifically a mountain team. So we tended to find ourselves up in the mountains, kind of, you know, scouting and reconning and running missions up there, developing relationships. Um, and one of the things that I think really for me that I didn't realize it at the time, you know, when you're a Green Beret, it is different. You know, it's not necessarily dress right dress. There's a lot of gray area. Um, you know, Mother Army, as what we call it, really puts a lot of trust in you to be thinking through, be very honorable, have a lot of integrity because you're operating on your own. Uh, I think the closest AOB to us was about 100 miles, and it was about a half hour to get any kind of support if you know we were taking fire or anything like that. So you're really out on your own. Uh, we embedded ourselves with the local forces. We worked with them. We trained them. In a sense, they led the missions. So we were working our way out of a job continuously. You know, and our job was to build up an army and teach them how to be an army and provide protection for themselves and then work our way out. But another part of that is intel gathering, you know, kind of, you know, what, what, what's in the local area, what are the networks like? Uh, so that aspect, and then also the other aspect of win the hearts and minds. You know, we did a lot of medical missions where we just go into a village, rebuild a mosque, build relationships, really show that we're not really here to stay. We're really here to rebuild. There were some bad guys that were out there, some bad actors. They needed to be taken out. The consequences of war are X, Y, and Z, and those need to be rebuilt. And I really love that aspect of, you know, seeing all the kids run around and seeing them run up to us and handing out Band-Aids and lollipops. And it gave me an appreciation for, you know, the world that my children live in for live in now. I'll never forget driving down a road and seeing um, just, you know, five, six year old kids selling gasoline on the side of a road out of two liter bottles or or even being used as as part of a ruse to you know get us to pull the trigger on certain things. I mean, they, you know, it was it's a it's a nasty environment um, when you're in a theater war and uh, you, know, you see some things. But it was really cool to. I felt like I left a positive impact on it. You know, all politics aside, I think you know I went there as a human. I saw other humans. I did the best I could. Uh, supported my brothers. They supported me and. Um, and, uh, you know, after about eight years, I, I got out, you know, I wasn't, I never went in to intend to stay for, you know, 20 years. Um, I got out, came home and I, I was lucky enough to have, uh, a bit of a, a soft transition, if you will. Um, I got out, I started working in the defense industry itself. You know, there's a whole beast of an industry out there of the defense industry that supports the military. And, uh, and, you know, I live in, I live in, 
Yes, sir. Well, just because you're rolling, which is great. And I don't want to, so we kind of hit that point where you're getting out of the service. So I just want to, can we go back and just hit a couple things though? Cause um, you know, I just want to, cause I mean, you, I know they're part of your life and you've integrated them in and they're just kind of another part of the foundation is that is who you are. Um, but I, I just kind of, you know, I guess one of the things I kind of want to, because obviously at least all the experiences that we've had with any special forces training in whatever branch of the military, there's a lot of training, you know what I mean? A lot of that kind of stuff. And so I don't want to, and you don't have to go too much. I guess what I was wondering though, at 19, when you enlisted, I guess, talk to us just for a minute about, you know, the impact of training, how it sat with you, maybe some lessons learned. And then the same thing that transition. I mean, what was your kind of maturation process, you know, as it interfaced with the army and the training as you went through that whole process? I mean, what were you discovering about people? You know, how did you feel it would impact you? You know, who were you discovering Adam Clark was? Maybe just a couple of those insights along the way. I mean, it seems like you must have had them. And I, I just think those are kind of valuable for people because one of the things that I really appreciate about your story already is this notion, like you wake up at 19 and like this bolt of lightning, I have clarity about my path. I'm going to follow my heart. And here I go in right. the face of quitting school and not talking to your parents. OK, and then same thing. It's like you kind of have this mission about it. And I, I want to come back to that. Like maybe what is your kind of oversight of purpose and mission? But anyway, could you just talk to us a little bit more about some of the lessons learned how it impacted you and how it helped you either grow up or whatever during that process a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, sometimes we, I think as vets, we really just like gloss over everything and then right. it's like, and life after, bye. <laughs> you know, not that we don't want to talk about it. You know, it's like, I didn't really do it to talk about it. You know, Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. But I just think too, a lot of folks don't have that experience. And I just think, you know, it, cause this was, I think important to help understand kind of how it does impact you down the road later how you interpret the deployments and the things that you experience in theater and then also the transition back out. So anyway, Amy, were you going to, did you have something or? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm glad you kind of paused because one of the things that I wanted to highlight was, you know, you saying that you're kind of in this limbo of like, you know, am I a man? Am I still a boy? Like, do I have to have these conversations with my family? And like, as somebody who is, and it sounds like you're really close to your family too. Like as somebody who is super close to my family, like, I know that there have been some things where I'm like, I just have to do this and not talking about it has been the easiest way for me to stay true to myself. But then at the same time, there is this crazy balance between the maturation process and you kind of standing in your power and being like, I am a part of this family, but I have my own autonomy and my own choices within that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when I was in that college phase, I would say I was putting a lot of energy into things that were not positive towards my life, you know, partying. Um, that's about it at that time. Um, no real direction. I mean, I loved history. I love reading books, but it had nothing to do with my classes. You know, so I would read other things. And I think one of the, the, the two words that stick out to me are intestinal fortitude. And, you know, I don't think when I signed up at the time, that's what I knew what I was looking for. But I remember being, you know, after so once you make it into the Q course, the intensity ramps up like nobody's business. I mean, that's where it, the rubber meets the road, because in the Q course, they don't necessarily uh, the, the instructors are there, but they give you enough rope to hang yourself. They're looking for individuals who have what it takes to dig deep, deeper than you've ever dug break through, keep going deeper, and then come back up with something. And um, there was a specific moment. It was, it was a rainy slash snowy night. Uh, we were walking through. I had this massive load on my back. I mean, I'm not kidding. It was about 230 pounds of weight just on my back. That doesn't include the weapons I was carrying or everything that was in my pockets. And I just remember really getting to the front of the pack because I was a point man and being able to set a pace for myself that got us to the mission and constantly calculating in my head, this, my steps, how many steps am I taking every hundred you know, feet, how, how or every hundred meters, how long are we getting there? Those things started to all click. And I remember an instructor was like, man, you've got some intestinal fortitude. And I was like, I think that's a compliment and I'm going <laughs> to take that. So you're not sure with these guys, you know, they're just kind of like, you know, they don't really talk to you or, you know, but I just remember feeling this like, yeah, I do. Like I felt it in my gut. Like there it is. There it is. That weight. I want to carry it. I want to lead it. I want to go. 
And it, it was kind of like the snapping moment for me because in the Q course, I wasn't like the greatest student. I wasn't, you know, the leader of the pack, but I'm also coming in off the street. I don't have any experience in the army and I'm just kind of getting shoved into this program and learning on the fly, just drinking from a fire hose. And so I think it was, uh, you know, this buildup of confidence of the, you know, learning that I really can learn, that I can learn. It's not, you know, because I think when I'm leaving college at the time, I'm thinking I'm not as smart. I, I shouldn't be here. You know, and then I'm getting into the Q course and we're talking some, you know, really technical conversations on one end. You got religious, uh, philosophical conversations on another end. And you're taking all of this in and expect it to make decisions like that. And, you know, getting that ability to start your mind to start like you're thinking of your mind as a tool not just something that like receives information and then makes you smarter. It's not, it's what you do with the information, how you can react. And so it was like those moments. And then as I started to go through and, and get to group, you know, I got honor grad at a couple of different schools. Like it just, and adopting that professional, you know, warrior mentality and, you know, putting all, putting energy into a craft that you're so much, you have so much passion for, but then also the cause, you know, it's like, yes, I love this profession, but why? And the why was, you know, you're talking about freedom, free, you know, free the oppressed. Um, you know, like I, I never got into a lot of fights growing up. I, I think I got in two. One of them was, you know, defending another guy. Like I'm kind of a protector, you know, and I, I really like the aspect of big bad green berets going into a nasty area and, protecting people and building them up. And um, I mean, and you get a chance to do that. It builds up a lot of your confidence and just grit. Like how far, how deep, how deep can I go? You know, how bad can it really get? You know, and you know, there's times as you're going through the Q course or you're overseas and it's just, it's, it's nasty. And you think you've hit rock, rock bottom. And then that bottom falls out. And, you know, I think it's like a constant, and I think life is that way. I mean, even after the military, there are just things, you know, life in general, there, you know, you have this roller coaster ride. And, but I think what, you know, the military gave me, the Q course gave me, working on a team gave me was that ability to recognize when that roller coaster is going down. And then you just get better with each iteration of how to come back up and succeed and blow through any previous threshold of success you thought was your height in the future. So. Okay, so a couple things because you just like, you know, there's a whole course right there. So, so we do, you know, mindful awareness and performance, so kind of mental stuff. And I got some questions later, but a couple things I want to just. So, the thing about recognize that your brain is a tool, you know what I mean? So, we think of the mind and the brain as two separate things, right? The, the you know, so the brain is actually the physical kind of, you know, the thing sitting in here. And then the mind, though, is this consciousness of whatever. And so, we're always working on it through meditation, but developing the mindfulness to have a sense of awareness that thoughts are just thoughts, information is data, but yet we need to process it. And then we always talk about the pause between stimulus and response, right? Mm -hmm. So you have stuff coming in, you analyze it, you don't do anything until you're making, and then, but you don't have a lot of time and then you're making decisions about it. And those are skills that we're working with athletes around as well in games and life and whatever. So mm -hmm. that point, so really appreciate that because that I think is huge. And if indeed the military would certainly do that for you. And the second piece, just, you know, the internal fortitude, as you called it, we talk about resiliency. I think it's that same kind of thing. Yes, it's like, you know, and, and not emotionally responding to ups and downs because those things are just there. That's what's in front of you. Right. Mm -hmm. And it may or may not be good. You know, maybe it's raining and it feels like it sucks, but maybe the rain is really good because it's a cover and nobody can find. I mean, I don't know. You know, I'm just, you know, whatever. Absolutely. But, yeah. but the thing is by doing those things. And so we talk about building confidence. So we talk about in that arena, it's like confidence isn't built just in your head sitting in a chair. You know, you have to go out and do shit to earn confidence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, and so and because the reason you can sky this high is because you took this hill and then you took this hill and then you took, you know what I mean? And so it's a yep. constant evolutionary process of continuing to build your skill sets, building on your confidence, developing a belief in yourself. And so when you hit the shit, whatever that is, it's like, we, we prepared for this. We've been here. We maybe not this exact thing, but I mean, me and my guys, we're ready to roll. And so no big deal. Let's lock and load and we'll go. So anyway, I just want to kind of mention those things because I think that confidence building piece 
And that extrapolates to, like you said, in life in general, right? When you're an entrepreneur, the first time you go about it, there's all kinds of stuff you don't know. And you're learning how to run a business, how to run the books, do the taxes, pay bills, do invoice, whatever. And then the more you do it, it starts to become second nature. And then you can take bigger steps, increase your market scale, whatever, and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So same kind of deal. So anyway, you are not an M. I just I want to give you a shot in there, too. So great stuff. I just want to kind of capture like there's other things we love talking about on the show because they're so important. I really appreciate you bringing those up. Emmy? Definitely. Yeah. And keep me, you know, keep me within, you know. <laughs> no, and, and I think like even yogically, like one of the reasons that we practice these, like when I sit and do these longer meditations or when you're doing these kind of practices that really put you on edge and like, right. Cause sitting still is so hard and oh, sitting yeah. still and meditating and like being in that stillness. And sometimes, you know, obviously as we think about athletes or green beret or, you know, veterans of any sort, it's like that going, going, going feels very kind of natural and familiar, but the sitting still can also be really treacherous and terrifying at the same time. And so it hurts. Right. And so there's this whole concept though, of we do that to strengthen our nervous system so that when we're off the mat or when we're away from these like peaceful, peaceful situations that may not feel peaceful, it's like you, you can hold it and you can hold space for it instead of, right. So it's just that riding the roller coaster of being able to step back and be like, you know, this is just today and it's not my whole life and it's not going to be the rest of the week, but it's today and I have to be present in it and be in it. And so, you know, all of these different practices, right. Whether it's, you know, I I mean, I can't, I haven't done the training you guys have done, but from our stories, it sounds pretty crazy. Um, but all of those things that prepare you for life away from the training. And that's kind of why it's so important to be present and to, I mean, exactly what you said, like your mind is a tool and it's just a way to strengthen and like be more present with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, enjoy the sock and just, you know, embrace it when it's raining. You know, uh, I think about how it's, you know, yes, it's cold to me, but, you know, the earth needs this rain to, you know, clean itself and, and do all that stuff. I, so I started, I, I, when I got out of the Q course, I made it onto a team. I started to practice, started practicing yoga quite a bit. And uh, it was funny. Cause like, you know, here we are a group, you know, everyone's running around in ranger panties and your shirts and everyone's jacked. And then there's Clark over there doing a downward dog for whatever, you know, looking like a weirdo. Um, yeah, at first I did it because I, I just wanted to stay agile, you know, getting in and out of turrets, getting with all that gear. I didn't want to have back problems. I saw guys that, you know, couldn't move as quickly as they needed to be able to move because of injuries. And, you know, I think we all have it. We all have that ability to get confidence. We all have that ability to uh, find the grit. We all have the, it's in there. But we have to, as individuals, go discover it. But by practicing yoga, it kind of taught me that alignment between mind and body. And, you know, like what you said, like sitting there, just sitting there and really allowing the universe to talk to you or, you know, receive unconscious messages, if you will, or feelings and, and being emotionally aware of not only yourself, but those around you, which, you know, helped me in the army when you're in a you know, high stress situation with a village leader and you've got your team sergeant who's getting frustrated and the interpreter, we don't know where his loyalties lie. And, you, you know, you're, you're, you know, you may not be able to hear them speaking or understand the words that are coming, but you can start to read these cues and you start to dial into that. And that almost is 90% of the conversation conversation right there. And, you know, it's the same thing here, at, you know, at work, you know, when we've got employees who are stressed out about something, but they're not you know, talking about it, but, you know, having that moment to like, if you're going to be a leader, you know, sit down and allow yourself that, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of, you know, space for your mind to really clear out because then what really comes back is what matters. You know, what matters is your mission. What matters is your family. Why are you doing this? Um, Kind of reminding you of what's important. So when you do hit those uh, pits of depression, which are inevitable, we all get them. I think they can be pretty extreme for veterans. I know sometimes it, it hurt. It's like, it's just like, oh, you know, even two weeks ago, I'm sure I had something where I just, I don't know, you just don't want to, you know, Veterans Day, you know, that's always kind of a tough day um, to, you know, think about the faces, you see their faces, you see their smiling faces, you know, that they're not here to enjoy that day. I used to hate it. You know, I just, I didn't like Veterans Day. You know, I felt bad that I got to enjoy, you know, free Applebee's. Well, you know, it, it, like it was like the cost comparison was not the same. 
Um, but over time, as I've had children and uh, to see the appreciation or to hear a thank you and, and to kind of remember that, you know, they're with me when we celebrate that day, like we're all together. It's kind of like the boys are back together. And even though we're not physically there, you know, over time, and I think it comes with practice of yoga and meditation and journaling. I journal a lot. Um, you know, sometimes I'll be walking through my day. It'll be so crazy. I just sit down and just start writing what's on my mind and it'll have nothing to do with what I'm trying to focus on, but it kind of clears that pathway of like, okay, let's put that away, Adam. Let's get back to our focus and our objective of today and, uh, you know, refocus. Cause I think once we get a little unfocused, we start to get unbalanced and we start to get unbalanced. We start to, uh, under, uh, underperform, underperform can lead to lack of confidence. And, you know, it's that vicious cycle and it's a slow trickle effect until it's, it's like a balloon, letting it all out until the end is like, you know, and to recover from that stage is harder than catching yourself over time, um, and bringing it back. So, you know, like I said, I hope, I hope I'm kind of hitting the point here, but no, I mean, like you're like on this like yogic path right now. That's like everything that we kind of preach. Right. And so I guess I have like five different things that I wanted to comment on, but I mean, what you just said at the end, like, that's the whole point of it's like those things that come in and those like stimuluses and these events. And it's like, they're real, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you can't pretend that they're not real or, you know, it's so easy for us to sit here and be like, you don't have to associate with your thoughts, but like, sometimes my thoughts like put me on my knees and yeah. they put me in a place where I can't function or I'm not showing up as my best self. Right. And so using yoga or journal, like I'm a huge journaler. And so even if it's not like, it's just like, I have all these ping pong balls in my head and I have to get that out so that I can still go on and focus. Um, but so to go a little deeper with the yogic stuff. Um, so today is a nine day and in yogic numerology and one of the lineages that I practice and study is called Kundalini yoga. And so nine energy is the subtle energy. So it's that subtle body and it's really cool. Like the more awareness and the more you slow down and are able to sit with it, that's when you, like you were saying, like when you're on these missions and you can just kind of like sense when something's going on, or you can be like your level of awareness and your kind of sensitivity to not only like, what is someone saying? Like, well, what's their body language saying? How are they approaching me? How are they coming at me? And it's like, you gain, like, it's just, there's just so many different applications. A lot. Yeah. I I mean, I remember like sitting in a Humvee and I was kind of about two, three years now to my practice of yoga and I just remember being able, as weird as it sounds, like feel yeah. something a hundred meters off that hadn't even presented itself and lo and behold, things would come around the corner or do you like, it's like your awareness leaves just the individual body and you're able to really accept all that's around you. And for me at that time, it was about alertness, you know, situational awareness um, you know, the, it was, it was, kind of, I tried to get other guys to practice it, to uh, very little success over the years. Uh, I think it was when I did, uh, what a sleepy baby, you know, you're on your back you put your feet up and you know, it's just not the one that they wanted to practice. It felt funny to them. So it feels uh, great though. It's so great for your low back. Oh, I loved it. I mean, uh, you know, but, um, but you really do start to sense some things and just calm down your mind, you know, cause you, even over there, you're thinking, you're thinking about home. You're, you've got other distractions there, you still have, you know, social things going on, your buddies in the army and the, you know, but then you have that environment of why you're there, that whole mission um, and, and trying to stay healthy and keep yourself sane. Cause sometimes you're just sitting there, you know, in the middle of the desert and, you know, for whatever reason, we're not doing any missions this month. You know, we're kind of just sitting like ducks. And so that can drive a person kind of crazy and, uh, you know, getting into those practices and I think it's, you know, constant improvement and, um, you know, kind of thinking about like who, like, if I don't know who I want to be, I at least want to be my best self when I get to that point and I discover that. And uh, that's why I've really always encouraged the you know, practice of yoga. Um, you know, it, and, you know, it's amazing to me, you know, a lot of guys don't journal or really express their feelings or, you know, like it's okay to not be okay. Like, you're damn right. And it's okay to admit that even if it's to yourself in the car on the way to work, you know, I don't think what is okay is wallowing. And I think by not wallowing is a couple of th- ways is talking to someone, finding a buddy, calling up an old friend. You know, you know, I'll feel the, and it's kind of funny too, because I'll feel this cycle 
collectively with other with other guys I served with because about mm, once every six months there will be a flurry of calls between us all you know like Gooding will call or Nate will call or Matt or McConaughey you know like and then we all kind of like find ourselves talking and then it's silent for a while and then there's like this cycle where it's like we're thinking about each other again or something happens in the world where we're all thinking about it you know I, I know when everyone pulled out of Iraq the first time and you know ISIS came in and it kind of decimated all the work that we had done. All, all of our Iraqi friends and counterparts met a terrible end. And I think we all felt like, oh, what was that for? You know, and I think there's a lot of guilt on that. Like we should have still been there or whatever it may be. But um, so it's, it's interesting to go through those and maintain those connections. It can, it can be hard because you come home and you're alone. Um, you're, you're, you're in one society, you're in one culture, you're in one new language, and you really do meet a language barrier on the outside, uh, an understanding of, you know, why am I upset around Christmas? You, you, you know, cause I'm thinking, look at all this gaudy gifts and all this wrapping paper and all this hoo-ya about Christmas. And I'm just thinking, uh, you're thinking about the guys who are still there or didn't, who don't get to come home or who the, the, those children, you know, that, uh, yeah, I mean, they may not celebrate the same uh, religious holidays, but man, they'd be happy to have a pair of shoes or even some socks. And uh, so you kind of look at it and, you, and again, you feel that like guiltiness and, and you in a way lash out, you know, like, you know, shut up. It's not that important, you know, and civilians don't necessarily like understand that. And we have a harsh humor uh, in the military. And so there's this you know weird transition period where you really do feel like, you're just alone and your buddies aren't there. The spree day cores aren't there. The spree day core is not there. And um, you miss that. You yearn for that. You, 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 you fueled on that. You did it for your buddies. And now here you are working a job, a nine to fiver, you go, you know, go from barrel chest to freedom fighter to, you know, promotional item salesman. And man, talk about some humble pie, you know, but uh, you know, I don't necessarily know if, People don't know what it's like to feel an explosion. People don't know what it's like to see someone with their leg blown off or, or whatever, you know, uh, they just don't get it. <laughs> you know, it's a yeah. hard, it's a weird life to live, yeah. you know? So even, even here, like when things get stressful, you know, sometimes people look at me like, why aren't you more stressed? You know, you're the leader here. I'm just like, I'm not getting shot at. So it's all, it's all still pretty good. Right. I'm going home tonight to sleep in a bed or the cot that's upstairs. I, <laughs> I don't know. It's not that big of a deal. So, yeah. well, hey, I just I want to circle back and just and Emma kind of touched on this, but for those of you know, because um, we we are working trying to help bring meditation and mindfulness and these practices. And so the one I just want to add, I think one of the things that gets you know, um, I think the breath work and the meditation, like when you're in the moment of stress, you can use it to kind of pass through all the intensity, so you can stay in that centered, calm spot. But the other side of it, though, is, and you mentioned this, and I just I really want to hit this, is that I think a lot of times the real strong emotions that we feel about different things, and even if we don't understand them, I know this is true for me personally, you know, initially, I use the breath work and the meditation to kind of bypass all that and just flush it out and get rid of it. So I felt calm, I didn't feel stressed and anxiety, but I really wasn't dealing with the underlying emotions and thoughts that were triggered, you know what I mean, by whatever was going on. Yeah. And so it's like through the meditation, you can kind of contain it. But then at some point, I think the breath work and meditation now for me is like I can pay attention to what I am thinking and feeling and I can create a safe space to kind of hold those emotions. And like and again, we talk all the time. Emotions are just emotions. They're not right or wrong per se. And so if I'm angry about something, it's not that I don't need to judge myself for feeling angry or feeling upset or feeling hurt. I just need to take a look and say, okay, why is that going on? Where is that coming from? And so that's the journey inside to try to understand that more deeply. And I think just this convert, these conversations that we've been having with vets who, you know, so many bizarre bundling of different emotions, you know, from the whole experience, you know, trying to find tools to unpack some of that stuff. And like you said, asking for help, acknowledging. And I think the piece that you mentioned is the most important step is the first step is be able to look in the mirror and acknowledge and tell you, say to yourself and honestly accept it. I'm not okay. And it's okay. You know what I mean? Just have that communication with the self and it's from there you can go on. Cause if you can't admit it to yourself, it's really hard to ask for help somewhere else. Yeah. But anyway, so that those tools, because like, if you don't embrace and enter into the fire of all those emotions, then you're still carrying all that stuff around. And then you never really have an opportunity to kind of heal from it. And then 
hopefully get to a point where I can contain all that. I know where it's coming from. I've learned about myself. I've worked through some of that stuff, integrated it back in. And now the, the peaks aren't quite as high when we get to that point. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of tie that emotional piece because sometimes it's great to flush it just to stay kind of centered. But then other times we do have to pull back and like hold that emotion and take a look at it so we can kind of get to know it a little bit better. So anyway, so so great stuff. Ab. Thank you. I didn't know you're like in the yogi kind of world. So this this he right up our circle here, Amy. So it's What's all your, good. Do you have a um, like a daily practice that you do now? Right. So a lot of the stuff that we work on is establishing a morning routine or like building practices that help you to tap into that awareness on a regular basis. And so, like you said, journaling, but do you have like a morning routine an evening routine or like kind of X, Y, and Z that like is your kind of recipe to stay within this framework? Yeah. So I run a pretty crazy schedule. I mean, I get up at about four o'clock every day. I do about 15 minutes of yoga and it's nothing strenuous, but it's that moment to like open up the body. Like just got out of bed, just open up my body and then just kind of sit there for about five minutes and just kind of think about what I got going on today. I mean, you know, we started a company here out of a garage. We've been through some crazy times here at the business. And so like this is my new world where I you know, really apply that energy to gratitude. You know, think about the things that I'm, I'm thankful for because, you know, you know, you know I think we forget about that and, it, and that it's a constant practice, you know, yoga and journaling. Like, it's not like a, I'm going to do yoga for six months and I'm going to be cured of all my, you know, uh, all my fears and anxieties. You know, it's really a practice that and life is a practice. Like we kind of look at it and kind of enjoy, but um, you know, I, I do, in the, I get into that um, like through the morning, get on the road, uh, get up to the shop here. And I always just walk the floor and it's kind of part of my, like check in with my world and check in with those around me. You know, I've had this moment of, of yoginess and meditation, get on the road, get up here and kind of walk through and just, you know, not talk business, but talk emotion, you know, how's, how's your daughter doing at bowling or how's uh, you, you know, how's it, how was it with the kids last weekend or you know, things like that, that I think really pull people together because we're humans at the end of the day, all trying to accomplish something. Um, but they're putting their energy here. And so that, that I bring it up cause it's just a big part of what I do every day. Um, and then in the evening, you know, I, I do keep, I, I keep my journal with me everywhere I go. And, um, you know, it's funny. I actually, I went out to San Diego, uh, a couple, uh, two months ago and I was, uh, man, I, a board member and I were have kind of having it out a little bit. I'm all fired up and, and come, you know, I was really in the wrong. I was not performing the way I needed to do. I had misread some numbers and think, you know, but in, in the middle of all this, all this freddiness and jumping on and off, I lost my journal, which I had been keeping for about two and a half years. And it had a lot. <laughs> so if, if they, if someone finds that they're going to they're going to see an interesting mind. Um, but when I got back, and, you know, and I really needed that journal, I needed it, you know, like that's how I structure my day. And but I like took it as a sign that the universe was saying, nope, you are you are all over the place. You need to reset. <laughs> And get yourself a new journal and start over. And it was kind of nice because it was like a nice closed chapter. You know, I had some old things in there from, you know, just some of the feelings that I'd had from service and, the, you know, those late nights, like, like, why? Like, why am I feeling this way? And uh, so it was, I'll never get that again. And we really do we rarely ever go back and look at our journals. It's, the journal is kind of just like that physical outlet, allowing that like flow of pressure from your mind. And so it was kind of bittersweet to like, let that go. You know, it's like, no, like, don't go back and reread that stuff. You don't really need to. And uh, so I've started a new process. And, you know, so I walk around. But anyways, long story short, I get to the end of the day. And I've, I've got a couple of questions of like, you know, what am I thankful for today? You know, it's usually got something to do with my kids or maybe an interaction here at work or, or, uh, you know, something simple as like a good dinner, I'm like that was good. Um, and it kind of goes down through one of the other questions is what could I've done better today? Um, and, and a lot of the times what I'll typically, you know, ding myself in or think about is, you know, I probably could have been a little bit more mindful when I approached this problem. I probably could have slowed down a little bit and, you know, and approached it in a more, pra I could have listened more, um, things like that, that, you know, really, as you go into your next day, kind of thinking, all right, this is what I want to be. This is who I want to be today and taking those lessons learned on a daily basis and, I probably got stacks and stacks of journals like that, um, just 
you know, eventually I'll burn them or something, but you know, it's too much. Now, but. Well, yeah, I think that's a lot. And that's what, I think that's what scares a lot of vets getting out is it's a lot. It's work. It's work, but it shouldn't be anything new um, because, you know, typically veterans are people who want to perform at a high level. That's why they go in for the challenge. They get out, you, you, you pull those key components away from them, you know, uh, the training, the brotherhood or sisterhood or uh, the camaraderie, uh, the environment itself, you pull those away from them, the structure, and you're kind of lost. And so it is hard work, but it's some, it's hard work that can occupy your mind. That's going to allow you to improve as a father, uh, um, as, uh, you know, as, a, as a worker, as an individual, um, even looking at your personal attributes and you know, I see a lot of guys, they let themselves go when they get out. I mean, you know, that, that structure was there. And now you have to, you know, recreate that structure yourself. And um, it's a lot of energy. It's, it's hard to do and it's not easy. I think that's, you know, part of it and why a lot of folks struggle. And I think just awareness on these things that, hey, like, it's okay to, to put a little work in. It's okay to take 20 minutes to journal, even though you feel uh, a little, a little sissy, uh, you know, by journaling, but like, you're not, you're, 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 you're putting your heart out there and no one has to read it or anything like that. You know, I, th- I just think getting it off your mind into a physical form uh, is a tremendous value. Uh, and that to me is probably one of the best starting points is, you know, people are like, I don't know what to write. It's like, write that, write that down and see what that next line says. Yeah. So just so just again, because you're just great stuff. So thank you. I appreciate um, so I think on the journaling stuff, I think that's really true because like you, I never sit down every morning when I start, you know, I kind of just go. But like invariably, you know, I try to do at least three pages. I use three ring binders because they're just easier for me and I stack them and put a date on them, and whatever. Um, but invariably, you end up somewhere you never thought you'd be going because it's just right. like like putting pen to paper, they're just about the process, you know, and it's kind of described in the artist way, but there's a lot of different resources for it. Um, so I do think that's really important. And so yeah, I, I appreciate take command of the day versus the day taking command of you. Right. Cause you're that's kind of thinking and then it gives you that clarity. And like you said, you can just kind of dump all that stuff out. Like, Ooh, you start writing. You're like, man, I guess I thought a little bit more about that than I did. The other piece, the end of the day piece, we have something called the eight C's of mindfulness or the eight tools. And so the, eighth one, although they're not really in order, is what we call collective reflection. Mm. But, you know, it's that point so that, you know, we have this conscious awareness, which is that curiosity, paying attention, being aware of stuff, um, the calm breath, and it kind of goes through all those stages. But the last one is always kind of circling back after we got through that process from pause to response. So like you did at the end of the day. So I love that about the gratitude journal. So there was, you know, it's like, you know, grateful people are happy. It's not that happy people are grateful. You know what I mean? That whole thing. And so paying attention to gratitude and then asking that question, like, you know, what could I have done better today? That's a piece about, you know, constantly going back and taking a peek, like, and, and that's like when I work with athletes, one of the, we just go, we always review their last week and like, hey, uh, you know, what mindfulness challenges did you have? Right. You mind, or not mindful. How did it work out? What did you learn about yourself? And just kind of always processing that. So they're critically reexamining kind of how they approach situations so that when that comes up again in the future, you can kind of pay attention to it. And it's not a guilt thing. It's just like you said, like I could have done that a little bit better, you know, and that awareness of it. So the next time you walk in that room and you can feel it, you go, Hey, I did this six months ago. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I know I'm going to be better at it today. Cause I want to be my best self, just like you said. And then there's that learning process. And so by constantly reviewing it in that still calm, calm space, we can learn a little bit more about ourselves. So anyway, all right, Emmy Lou, anything else you want to pop in there? I mean, so much, but I think the other thing is like when you, your comment about like, taking control of the day. Right. And so a a lot of people that we work with, it's, I mean, athletes are not, it's, um, I don't know how to slow my thoughts down. And I, like, I can't slow down enough to actually like find some clarity within that. And the act of actually writing for me has been such medicine in that way of like, I literally have to slow down and write the word. Um, and that has really, really helped me. And I think some people like, as you start a journaling practice, right. It feels really weird, but I think, committing to writing like one page the first week and then two pages, or maybe it's like on a monthly basis, but like, I'm just going to write for this. And it doesn't have to be 
like you said, you can just write, I don't know what to say. Or you'd be like, this is stupid. I listened to this on this podcast or blah, blah, blah. I'm supposed to be finding clarity stuff comes out. And it's like, it's literally, we always talk about holding space, right? So how can you hold space for others, but how can you create exactly dead? How can you create this kind of bubble where you can just be, and there's no expectations. There's no, like, there's no agenda. There's mm-hmm. no timeline. It's just, this is part of my self-care routine. And like, I think sometimes the word like self-love is just kind of like thrown around and people are like, that's dope. That would be cool. I don't know what to do yeah. though. And I think yeah. journaling is a huge part of my self-love and like my self-care because it helps me to slow down enough to where like all those moving pieces, it's like the main things are coming through. And if something else needs to show up, then I'm still holding space for myself. And within this kind of, you know, 20 minutes or whatever I have, or even like, sometimes I'll be like, like I carry a journal with me everywhere, just like you said. And it's like, if I am like driving somewhere, running errands and something kind of happens, I'll write about it. And I'll just like take a moment in my car to be like, what, what was that? Mm -hmm. Um, but, and then the other thing, somebody, uh, taught this to me recently, but like as a gratitude journal at the end of the day um, a praise journal. And so like writing things that you're proud about yourself, because Mm -hmm. a lot of us live in a world where there's not somebody like, we're not on a team anymore, you know, and if you're not connected to your family in that way, or know how to have those conversations and, you know, to have people say like, I'm proud of you, like that means a ton. And that kind of brings you back. Yeah, exactly. And so if you can say that to yourself and end the night on being like, I am proud of myself for showing up and doing my grad. I'm sh- proud of myself for doing my morning pages and journaling. I'm proud of myself for getting outside today and like going on a walk. I'm proud of myself for not snapping when somebody pulled out in front of me. Like mm-hmm. I'm proud of those moments. Then if you can be proud of yourself, anybody can be proud of yourself. Right. And that's the whole thing of that's really what matters. Right. You know, it's right. Like- well, like we seek head. this external, we seek this external love from other people. But at the end of the day, a lot of it is just based on how we wish that we could love ourselves. Right. When we, it's yeah. like the better we can love ourselves, the more we can accept it and, re- and give it. Um, Cause you know, I kind of found that myself, like it's just, uh, I had a hard time loving myself and it was detrimental to certain relationships. And you know, I never want to have that happen again. And uh, you know, it's, it comes down to just self-awareness and it's, it's tough. It, uh, to get into that practice because it does feel like, well, I need to set time aside. Well, you know, if you don't do it early in the day, you know, or may, and, and make it a constant practice, it will slip. It will never really improve, uh, you know, what you want to get out of it. And, um, yeah, I don't want to keep rambling, but, uh, yeah. So get a journal and write. And I guess for me, I never go back. I'll sometimes go back and look at it, but like I have set, very clear boundaries. Like with anybody who I'm with at that space, like do not read this shit. I will look like a psychopath, like yeah. a psychopath, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's like, that is like the inner go, Adam. You don't yeah, want to know yeah. that. That's for me only. Yeah. Like, and I, sometimes I'm like, Ooh, I like don't even want to write. So like you're saying about, I might go back and burn these. Like part of me, I look at my stack of journals and I'm like, so proud that I like to me, cause that's like my mental health commitment. Like I sat down and wrote all that shit, but then at the same time, I'm like, there is some dirt in there. Like, yeah. And now it's like, like clutter in the corner and you're like, yeah, oh. like I should probably burn these. <laughs> yeah. So <gasps> all right. well, the last point that, so I want to, we, we need, let's jump back in a second to kind of your transition back and then introduce us to when you got involved in MVP because you and Nate go way back and all that kind of stuff. I guess the one other thing that you said, I just wanted to kind of, kind of pull together when you mentioned about, you know, not doing yoga just for six months or like, it's not like a 30 day diet and all that kind of stuff. I think, you know, the, for me, physically and mentally, the thing about yoga and meditation is like, no matter how deep you get, there's always like, you're always uncovering a new universe within, you know what I mean? So like, like maybe you can't touch your toes when you start yoga and then you start getting more flexible than you can. And then all of a sudden, oh, wow, pigeon opens up or, you know, there's all these, you know, and so you're not as deep here. And so then you get to that depth where you thought, well, I would never get there. And then you get there and you're like, oh my gosh, there's this whole nother thing. You know what I mean? And so yeah. it just keeps opening and expanding. And I think that's true on the mindfulness meditation path as well as like, you, you know, you start to be able to get 30 seconds of calm or whatever, right. and then you can do five minutes and then you can do 30. And then all of a sudden, you know, things are being revealed and you're starting to feel things and all that. And I think we, we lose a lot of people in that kind of start to, you know, getting comfortable with it because they're not getting dramatic results and all that. And they hear about it and they're like, yeah, it's not for me. I can't do it. But 
There's no unsuccessful meditation. If you're sitting there paying attention to your thoughts without judgment, you're fine. You know what I mean? It's all, that's all good. So anyway, I just wanted to like, give well, it's people not a destination. That, like it's, it's not, not a it's, destination. It's you're a, never going to like, you're not going I'm like really flexible. And then today, yeah. oh my, I was like stiff as a board. Like I couldn't do any of the stuff and it's super frustrating. And then it takes me through this whole, like, I suck at yoga. Why do I even teach? Like, this is the dumbest thing. And it's, so it's like, Emma, it's just a process. I just want you to know, I'm really proud of you. Oh, Ah, oh, there you go. Okay, let's talk. All right, so transition. So you get back, you're getting out. So talk us to about transition out of the military and then introduce us to MVP when that whole thing starts and, you know, why you got into that. Um, you know, so when I got out, let's see, 2013, um, started working for a defense contractor. And like I said, I kind of had this soft transition, if you will, um, you know, living out of Cincinnati. So my first job out was literally as a promotional item salesman. I was literally had been deployed to Iraq, came home six months later, I'm selling pens, pencils, you know, logo stuff, you know, like it, going door to door, you know, it was absolutely brutal. You know, here, here I am. I'm just like, yes, would you like to uh, buy 500 of these pens? We can put your logo on them. And, you know, people are, you know, get out of here, you know, so that was kind of rough, but the beauty of it is I walked in, you know, going door to door, walked into a defense contractor and, and being a special forces communication sergeant, we had specialty bits of communication that we use in particular. And this company happened to make that type of equipment. And so here I am, I'm waiting for the secretary to give me a moment of her time. And so I just kind of started looking around and I caught my eye, a couple of little pieces of, you know, the only stuff that we had had. And I was like, oh, do you guys make this? She was you know, kind of giving me that. I was like, yeah, you know, she's still on the phone. And, and I was like, oh, she got off. I was like, I've actually used all this stuff. So like, what do you guys do here? She was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm just a combo guy. And just kind of left it at that, you know, and that's typical, I think, for vets. They're just like, no, you were a Green Beret combo guy. You were just a combo guy. And uh, so she's talking that the president of the company happened to be walking by the office. She was like, Roy, Roy. She called him in and she was like, this guy's used all that stuff. And he was like, what'd you do? And I was like, oh, I was a Green Beret. And, this and that. he was like, so he takes me on a tour of the whole facility and I'm looking at everything. And I've got a bag of like, I'm like, I'm going to sell so many taco scrunchies at this, at this place. This is going to be great. And uh, he takes, he brings me around, sits in his office. and was like, would you like a job here? Because I, like I was talking how it worked and all it, it helped us on this particular mission. I remember using this piece because it was, you know, the, uh, it basically allowed us to go from line of sight to SAC on two different radio channels on one antenna. That's a big deal. You yeah. know? Uh, <laughs> um, he offered me a job in the spot. And so I started working for him and it was like I went through this dip and then I started working in the defense industry, uh, which was nice because even though we were all like still civilians again, it was a lot of people who were, you know, prior military. So there was a lot of, um, uh, a little bit of spree decor, but it just wasn't, you know, the de research and development stuff really didn't appeal to me, but it was a, a better paying job. I liked the environment. I really liked the owner. He taught me a lot and uh, kind of allowed. And, you know, with the Nate over the years, you know, just getting involved with different organizations and, yeah, it's so much fun to like run into someone who's got a tattoo or like has, has got that walk or has got those boots, you know, has got that one shirt from that one battalion that just they're wearing that no one else really gets or you're wearing or, you know, I got a couple shirts that are like kind of like have jokes on them that only you would get. And, you know, some, I mean, yeah, I it's just it's amazing. And, you know, even vets from way long ago. uh I walked into a, you know, an event and there wasn't many of us there. It was like kids were bringing, uh, so I coached some soccer teams and uh, one of the kids invited me and I went in and there was another Green Beret there. And I had never, I never knew him. And uh, he was in a different group and he stood up and was like, brother. And like, we both like, just, it was like, we had known each other forever, right. slapped hands and just like hugged and like hugging talking to each other like i was in this group i was good i mean we're not even looking at it. we're just so, we just didn't stop hugging and I, I and like it was a weird moment it was like i don't even know this guy he fought in a different war but here we are just like hugging it out because like, it was like we both needed it in that moment yeah. we can be as tough as we want in that day but man a hug feels good especially from someone else who has kind of been through the fire and um 
I think it's really important to stay connected and to be proud. Um, I know I felt a lot of guilt when I came home a lot. It was, uh, it was overwhelming. Um, I didn't really want to wake up. Um, I was, uh, you know, kind of lost words, but probably one of the most, uh, hardest parts of my life. Just, um, sorry. That kind of hit me there. Just, uh, you know, not being lost anymore um, and why it's so important to kind of reconnect those people who get it, that that world that you were in and understand like like just the, the you know, of like being together, or fighting together, like truly life or death fight. You know, because I think there's a lot of analogies in our world here that uh, on the civilian side that it may seem like life or death, but it's not. Yeah. And, you know, when you've lived over there it, and it's real and you come back here, you have trouble really relating to someone who's bitching about the coffee being too weak or donuts didn't show up on time on Thursday. Like, you know, you get you just get itchy with that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, when you meet other people and, it, you know, that's why I love manufacturing personally. Uh, you know, I was in defense and I got and I found a lot of vets were in it and they're it seems to be a lot of esprit de corps. So like what I tell a lot of vets who are transitioning out of, out of the military is I always tell them like, look into manufacturing, like go, because there's, you know, there's a purpose at the end of the day, we got parts, we got a ship, there's a team, you know, we get, we get gear, we wear the same shirts, you know, shop shirts and this and that. And you kind of, you know, we've got a couple of vets here on staff and I mean, they're just, you know, they're our manufacturing commandos. Like you can kind of tell like that purpose is back there again. So you know, and I know not everyone's going to go into manufacturing, but, um, you know, I just I, I, I felt like if that was one thing I saw that as a question, if one thing I would have known, like as weird as it sounds, is to have found a profession, you know, not have fallen into one, but maybe gone out and sought a profession that kind of mimicked the army a little bit, you know, because we have timelines here. We start at 6 a.m. on the dot, butts and seats. You know, we can, we have that type of environment that. You know, it's one of those things that was kind of pulled away. But now, like for me, I feel like we're giving that back to come and live on this platform of structure, of, of a goal, of, uh, of a mission, a combined mission, you know. And, you know, when you're doing military planning, you always state the mission twice. So every staff meeting, I start off with stating the mission twice. So everybody knows what's, what the page is, what direction we're going. And, um, you know, it's, I think it's pretty cool. So kind of rambled, but. You know? No, you're good. Well, then, uh, so when did you get hooked up with MVP, though? Um, when was that? And just talk, talk to us a little bit about that, then. Um, well, I don't know much about MVP in itself. I've known Nate for a long period of time. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, I've mainly been working with uh, Green Beret uh, Foundation uh, just because they were local. Honestly, Fran – uh, who is the chapter president down there, chased me down for years. You know, I didn't want to come to an event. I didn't want to go to the golf outing. I didn't want to do anything. Um, and as we, you know, started to get into you know, and, and staying connected with Nate, and uh, he had always been working with it. And, uh, it, like, that has been probably, you know, I guess where I've been putting most of my energy is, uh, you know, that sort of thing and work with Nate, following his story and, and helping other guys who are getting out that even, even as far as like resumes or anything like that, you know, I think a lot of people have a hard time transitioning door kicking skills to, you know, a, a real world job when really it's not the door kicking, it's the planning that led to it, the execution of the mission, the, the accountability to others, getting your stuff done, making sure you have the supplies. Like you, you forget about all that stuff that went into that one moment where you kicked in that door. And, uh, you know, I think it's kind of, you know, some of the, these organizations like that really empower you to think about your whole life, everything that you accomplished in there and how that relates, but also the struggles between that point and coming over because it's a different world. You can't act the same. You know, I'm, I, I, <laughs> that promotion line, we went into a meeting and I was like, we're going to go cook some, you know, use some choice words. And my boss was like, Adam, we don't do that here. We don't talk like that. I was like getting fired up. Like we're going to go to that board. We're going to sell all these, you know, all these pens and shirts. It's gonna be <laughs> and uh, like, like that intensity wasn't there. So, uh, so hope, not to let you down, but uh, 
No, no, it's okay. We're keeping it real. So it's all right. Well, then tell us a little bit about the Green Bay Foundation. If if there's more to say or not say, that's okay. Yeah, they do a lot. They they really do a lot of uh, – yeah, they're specifically, obviously, for Green Berets who are transitioning, but also mainly focused on Green Berets who, you know, have been injured and are not – are not the same, have lifelong injuries that are going to stick with them. They help them in that transition process, whether it be, you know, uh, accessible homes, uh, fundraisers for, you know, medical bills, helping out families, gold star families. Um, you know, and I, I think that was somewhere that was really lacking. I think about 2015, I want to say is when, um, they kind of came on the scene for me when I started to think about it, because there's a lot of veteran programs out there. And for me out the gate, I didn't feel like I needed it. And I felt like since I don't need it, I'm not going to get in the way of someone who does need it. You know, I'm not missing an arm. I'm, you know, I feel pretty mentally uh, straight, you know, if you will. And uh, so like, I didn't feel like those were area. But then as you start to see some of the smaller ones pop up who understand your unit and may also understand your mission. And then you meet other guys who they were from a different group, but it's the same you know, bra language that you're, you can speak and the different, uh, you know, you, you know, some of the same people, you feel a little bit more connected to home again. And uh, so they put on some races through the year, golf outings and just events to get people back together again. And, and it helps with professional networking as well. Um, and I think that's, that's part of it because you got to make a living after, uh, after the military. And, you know, it, it's a shame not to use the skills that, you know, they had in that the, you know, U.S. government had invested into you not to put those to good practice on the outside and to be a good representative of what you can be if you go into the military. Yeah. OK, so before we then kind of wrap, so we're kind of getting there. So I appreciate that. And again, we'll have links. The MVP links will always stay in there. So if people want to do that. And then you can send us the link for the Green Bay Foundation. That'd be and then we'll, make the, we'll do the donation with that, I guess. With the things that you were kind of talking about, I guess, you know, just kind of in closing, because you've offered a lot and I'm very grateful for the, and particularly the ideas on the transition. I think that those are really kind of unique insights. And so really grateful for that. What would you, was there anything else that you haven't said that you would like, you know, to kind of the general public about how to support, help and understand returning veterans for that, so that, and then also, you know, what's your pitch about it's okay not to be okay to returning veterans who might be hearing this, what would you want to say to those guys and or women, you know, about you know, getting help or whatever? So maybe a little bit of encouragement to folks who are just listening to this and how can they help? And then to those who are back here after serving our country, what would you want to pitch to those guys? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I think the general public, I always think about just say thanks, you know, keep those thank yous coming. Uh, we don't get them. At, we don't appreciate necessarily, we don't um, necessarily understand why we're, 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 we are receiving a thank you, but over time, it like it just kind of wears on your heart, and you start to realize, like, yeah, okay, I can accept that thank you. It's almost like a value back, you know. It's yeah. like instead of denying that thank you anymore, you know. So that's the one thing I would say is like always say, you know, say thank you, no matter what vet if they got a hat on, shake their hand, just get because that it means the world. It means the world to a lot of. A lot of vets because they don't you don't hear it you know a whole lot just like kind of you know quick thank you that's all they need is that um certainly there's a lot more that it could be provided but i would you know with the limited time that we have here i would just you know reiterate to continue to share your thanks with people who have been uh service members and then you know for those guys that are that are getting out you know i i would strongly encourage them to you know uh, journal and do some of those practicing, but you know, what works, you know, do some research, um, you know, find some help. It, it, it does take a little bit of effort on your side to start that process and understand that just because you're starting that process doesn't mean you're messed up or you're going to be unsuccessful or it's going to be, it's going to be a long journey. Anyway, life is life, you know? So I think that's one of the things that you have to realize is this is a phase and it's okay that this can be an opportunity to grow from here you're feeling so down here and this is an opportunity to grow so i think you know you got to educate yourself look for resources go read books pick up a podcast pick up an audio book pick up uh pick up anything you know whatever is making you just not substance uh you know don't alter the mind don't don't suppress you know release and you know whether it's a workout routine you you know 
don't forget, you know, represent what you were on the inside, you know, don't leave that and look back and been like, Oh man, I was awesome. Then be awesome. Now be awesome today. And that's going to take a little, you know, a lot of work transition and it's okay to understand that not everyone is going to understand. I think that's the one thing I maybe that Mm -hmm. I struggled with is that no one, they don't get it. They're not going to get it. You're going to go home. Everyone's going to be like, yeah, you're home. Let's go down to the bar and, you know, hang out. You don't want to do that, but understand that they don't get that. And I think once I started to figure out that like, it's not against them, it's not them. That's the problem. It's just, they don't necessarily understand what I've been through. And I think once you've recognized that, then you can kind of attack that problem because that's a gap. That's the main gap. When you get out, you're, you, there's a gap of loneliness. You're in no man's land. And the, and the new feedback input from society that you're getting it isn't jiving with what you know. But just knowing that little gap is going to happen, I think you can really prepare yourself mentally um, to you know, take positive steps in the future. So nothing specific, just a whole bunch of stuff. No, it's <laughs> throwing it all out. Good. I, so, and I guess I just want to throw out too. So we'll have uh, the Green Bay Foundation link on there. And I guess if any vets are listening to this and are curious about mindfulness or meditation or whatever, if anybody wants to shoot us a note, we'll be glad to try to hook you up locally with something. Definitely. Or if we can offer something, we're glad to do that as well. So we want to you know, continue and foster that. And again, we want to make it okay not to be okay and to ask for help and uh, you know, without judgment and without, I mean, one of the, there's three principles in kind of the Buddhist tradition around meditation. And one is that it's not, nothing's permanent. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes you feel like, but the reality is just nothing is. Everything's always changing and it's evolving and moving. And so whatever situation you're in right now, that too. So nothing's permanent. The second is nothing's perfect. Right. And so, you know, we try to be our best self. We try to do that. And so, you know, everybody has a day or, you know, things don't always go quite the way you want and all that kind of stuff. And the last is that it's really not personal, you know, in the sense of somebody doesn't understand where you're coming from or that whole piece or somebody blows up and all that a lot of times it's all about really what that person's going through in their life and those kind of things. And all you can do is again, control how you respond to what life gives you and Mm -hmm. and not to overly internalize it and all that kind of stuff. And then, like you said, we're encouraging folks to do some of the work and and we don't want to simplify it or make it sound like it's super easy because it's not, it's a, the journey within is I think one of the most difficult ones and takes a lot of time and can be kind of painful, but uh, the benefits and rewards when you come out the other side, eventually it's uh, pretty powerful. So, okay, uh, Lou, we've been chatting a lot and we've all been throwing around. Adam, I guess I want to say thank you. I'll give you a last word in a minute. Um, we should do the, uh, should we close them? You want to run us through that? and, and do the Yeah. Close for us? Okay. So, one of my favorite parts is our closing question, but, um, you know, we believe in hope and that the glass is always half full. So, um, Adam, what are some of the things that are giving you hope right now? giving me hope um you know i look at uh you know it's you know my children um you know who that hope for the future you know what what they're going and and i like to think that where i've been on my journey has left a better footing for them to continue to follow um that i you know hope that i'm doing things right um you know it gives me hope to wake up every morning that I'm alive, that I'm, that I'm breathing again, um, to go after, you know, to live in America. I mean, <laughs> this is one of the great, this is, you know, one of the greatest countries in the world. And, you know, it, it gives me hope just to know that we're here, we're free, we can go achieve and accomplish whatever we want. And I think it's a combination of those things that, uh, you know, get me excited every day. And, um, you know, um, I don't know, I'm kind of simple, I guess. So, doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, I think it's it's a little bit like gratitude, right? I woke up today. I'm healthy. My family's here. They're all good. You know, I yeah. don't need a whole lot more. So it's all pretty good. Absolutely. But, yeah. Lubu, what do you got for hope? Well, I was just looking at what time it is. And I feel like we just crushed. Like that just flew by. So I guess <laughs> that was really fun. Um, but Adam, I find so much hope in your story. And just the concept of... just being in it, you know, and like being not afraid to be in it and to talk about it. And to also, like, I just loved what you said about like 
absolutely it's okay to not be okay, but like you can't stay in it and you have to get to know yourself. And I think that's this whole journey, right? Is we're just getting to know ourselves and like what works best. And like, you know, sometimes for me, literally I will not do my yoga practice because it puts me on blast so hard. And I just emotionally, I can't take it. Like I'm just at a place where I'm feeling really frail. I'm feeling pretty anxious or I'm just like, like not in a good place, but I know that I have these tools and I know that I have the people in my life that when I'm like, really not in a great place, I can be like, Hey, I need help. Um, right. So, um, also gives me hope that you journal as much as I do. Cause that's great. I feel like <laughs> anytime we connect with people like that. So I guess I want to say, I'm so proud of you. So thank you for being on our show and that. really, and thank you for everything. Thank you for your service. Thank you for this message. Um, I just feel like you have so much value to add and the fact that you were willing to come on and share that with us is really, really special. So thank you. Awesome. I appreciate it. It's been kind of an honor. You know, Nate called me up a couple, you know, a week or two ago and um, you know, we don't get to share our message much, you know, we don't get platforms like this and um, this is a, uh, it's really a special thing. And like I said, this past veterans day was probably one of my best ever you know, I got to present to my daughter's class in second grade. So I kind of had to like, you know, dial it down a little bit, but <laughs> it was, it was neat. It was, it was a cool opportunity to kind of talk about that and, um, you know, get it out. It just, even though it was like at a you know, elementary level, it was, it felt good yeah. to kind of put that out there. And, and again, feel those guys that, you know, that are with me that, um, you know, so this is, this has been great. You know, it's a, it takes a, a and negative energy, like, well, just, it's so easy. It's like gravity it will pull you down, you know, and, and, and to, you know, positive energy is like flight. It takes energy. It takes a lot of jet fuel, it takes a lot of things to kind of go up and stay up. And, uh, you know, so if you think about it that way, you know, when you're feeling down, it's like, am I taking the easy route or am I doing the hard work that's necessary to get up and go? You can't stay stagnant. You can't stay in the same spot. It's kind of like Firebase. Like you cannot stay there for long. You have got to keep moving, you know? Yeah, I'm always moving forward. So, all right. Well, we thank you very, very much and appreciate, like, again, just sharing the story. And feels like it made that just a little bit more okay for people to maybe try a few things. And so, again, we want to be a resource. If anybody's out there listening and you need help or support, let us know. We'll try to connect you with the right people. We'll do all that. Adam, we wish you the very best when we're off. I just today got the tickets from the Niners for the game. So, I'll be sending you via their, I think it's through the Bengals site, but anyway, but I'll transfer those over to you. So you'll have those. Wonderful. And then when you get in, once you get in on Saturday or Sunday, uh, just shoot us a text, let us know where you're at. I've got those. And then hopefully we can hook up. Usually it's after the game, just because it's tough beforehand and all yeah, that. Sure. And, and uh, just do a Plus I'll be tailgating time. with all my Bengals gear on. That's okay. Oh, here. Assuming about sure? the 1987 you know, Super Bowl loss. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Oh, nice. Nice. He's one of my so favorites. Because we so we're in the, this is one of our kind of our jersey rooms. So George, you know, they're always switching jerseys and signing and all that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, so we, we, we've kept the Bengals in there. So we do have one in, in the house. So it's all good. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you have a tiger's tattoo or like some tiger stripes? Me? No, no. I actually <laughs> don't have any tattoos. So I'm just going to think about it. I almost, got, I, almost, I almost got real tatted up and then I, I chickened out. So yeah, well, you know, I had through him. Day, so I didn't do it. You know, in the NFL, it's um, you know when you first start because my kid plays for the Niners, you get a little territorial, and that's our tribe and all that kind of thing. But then, and it's 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 a lot like what you were talked about. Like you guys would be in different companies and have different duties, but you went through the same training. And the players that play, yeah, and I'm a players person. You know, what I mean, like you know, you got management, you got owners, and you got you know, there's all, so many other things going on. And there's only one segment that's really looking out for the players. And that's, you know, and so like the players have a lot more in common than they do. And I know they compete against each other in that particular game. Right. But other than that moment, you know, that 60 minutes of the game, then it's like, it's such a deep brotherhood in the same, you know, and it's not the same. I don't mean to equate it to. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, de- I mean, I can definitely see there being a struggle when you're in one profession, just, you know, again, as, you know, as a human, doing something and then transitioning out your identity is that's that thing you've been doing it you've been working so hard all these years all these dreams have come true and then now you're moving you know yeah so it's it's just like they talk about you know trying to find like you have support and love and a life after the uniform comes off so it is that and then while you're still in it and it's such a short window 
for most people in there, you know, it's usually not even over four years. And so it's such a short deal, but so there's a lot of love within that whole piece, just like what you were saying. And so like all the jerseys here, you know, we know all these guys, we have tight end you here. We had 50 plus next year. We'll have, you know, more like 200 probably or close to it. And so it's pretty fun. So anyway, well, okay. Well, thank you. I'll send you those and just confirm that you got them. I'll do that later this afternoon. And then hopefully we can hook up in Cincy at the game. And uh, yeah, that'd be great. You can wear all your uh, Bengali stuff and all that kind of piece, so it'll be great. So super excited for your future. Thank you for sharing. Much Great. love and blessings, and we're certainly grateful for you. So, Emmy, anything else? Oh, thank you very much. All I right. appreciate it, guys. All you right, guys man. Take care. Awesome. Yeah. All right, everybody, that wraps up another show. Can we just take a moment for all the mindfulness that we brought in? We have that new recovery segment. We have all the mindfulness with Adam. Um we have a puppy in the background, just feeling super. I mean, I know I say this every week, but I'm so grateful for the show, for Dane, um, for the messages that kind of come through and the space that we're holding only, you know, for ourselves to kind of discover through this, but then also um, to really give people the space to share their stories. And so to everyone who has shown up authentically, to people who reach out to us, um, we really, really appreciate you guys. So if you are interested in getting a little bit more involved and want to leave us a little holiday present, you can give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, we are on Instagram, Facebook, and tw- and TikTok as Hidden Pearls Podcast. We're on Twitter as Hidden Pearls Pod. Um, if you ever want to get a little bit more connected, you can shoot us a message on Instagram. Or the best way to get a hold of us is info at thunderbirdperformance.com. You can shoot us an email. Um, I know some of you guys have started doing that. And so it's really cool to kind of see those responses. So either way, I just want to give a huge thank you to uh, Dan. That was great. Loved meeting you. Um, also to Adam. Wow. Uh, thank you for your story. Thank you for your practices. And to Bruce and Pops. I am so grateful for um, so grateful for these strong men in my life who are also very vulnerable and open and really hold space for that kind of infinite wisdom and that strong feminine side. So to each of you, I am so proud of you and I love you guys so much. Um, and so yeah, just super, super happy. So with that, uh, go Niners. <laughs>